So our brief outline for today's workshop is we'll talk about why we might consider California native gardens and what a native garden is, how that's different from just a garden of low water plants. We'll talk about where do you even start? We'll talk about inspiration from natural plant communities and then maybe how to turn those into stylized gardens at home, which is one of many ways you can go to design a garden. We'll talk about different elements of native garden design. We'll talk about choosing plants, a detailed example of the design process, the basics of using a native garden design for wildlife habitat, and then we'll wrap up and provide additional resources. And we're going to start with a premise. Uh, landscapes take up a lot of space in Southern California. This is true for most of California. If you look at your neighborhood on an aerial photo, chances are it's going to look a little different than if you're looking at a aerial photo of like New York City or downtown Los Angeles, unless you live in downtown Los Angeles, in which case yeah, you could still have a native garden, even in a tiny space or, or on a balcony in some pots. But for the most of Southern California, we have the suburbs. And even though at the ground level, it feels like there's probably too much concrete, too much asphalt, maybe. There's actually a lot of green or you know, potentially brown, but, but space, uh, front yard and backyard, typical suburban lot, even if it's not huge, has more outdoor space than indoor space. And so for a long time, especially in front yards, the question has really been for most people, you know, does my front yard fit in with the neighbors? And, and if people are willing to get a little more eclectic than that and, and do a little bit more than lawn and, and a foundation planting and some roses or something, uh, the, the only question that I heard for so long was, was what, what is it going to look like? And don't get me wrong. What it looks like is important. We want our landscapes to be beautiful. But the last series of droughts have really opened up an opportunity for a new question that we can ask ourselves of our landscapes. These are things where we're using precious space uh, in our yards, in our community spaces, even at our, our local businesses. Uh, you know, space in California is valuable. And, and not only can we ask ourselves, what do our, our spaces look like? It's a minimum. But we should ask ourselves, what do we what do they do? What do we want them to do for us? Uh, and what are we willing to, to put into them? And so one of the things that I just makes me really excited about California landscapes and keeps me excited about California native landscapes year after year is that California native landscapes do more. They expect less in terms of water and resources. They don't need pesticides or fertilizers. Uh, depending on how you design it, the maintenance can be quite low. And they do so much more for us, which we'll get into in just a moment. But let's pause and just make sure we're all on the same page. What is a California native plant? Uh, a lot of people think lavender and rosemary are California native plants. And that's not the case. They're low water plants, but they're from the Mediterranean. Uh, Lantana is not a California native plant. A California native plant is a plant that essentially evolved here in California. It's generally considered a plant that has been here for a very, very long time. Uh, an easy way to think of it is uh, when Europeans first arrived in California, they brought many plants from many different places with them. And so a plant that was here before that, generally probably California native plant. It evolved in California along with the insects, birds, and other animals that did too. And if you get down to kind of specifics, a lot of times people, including myself, will lump in plants from Baja, California with California native plants. You know, we don't need to uh, get too picky, but essentially it's a plant that, that evolved somewhere around here. And what makes them special? Well, they're, if they are selected appropriately, they can be very well adapted to our conditions. And so that's to say, you know, Redwoods are California native plants, but they're not a well-adapted California native plant here in Southern California. So as long as they're from, you know, kind of a similar area to yours, so for us in Southern California, kind of relatively dry native plants uh, for in the most case, then, uh, then they're often going to work pretty well. Uh, beyond that, we'll get into resources later extensively about how to select those plants and give yourself the best chance for success. But overall, compared to all the other plants at the nursery, they're generally quite well adapted to our conditions. And because they evolved here, they actually have these special relationships with other native plants and with other native animals. And so lots of butterflies are very specific about there's only a few plants that their caterpillars can actually uh, 
feed and grow on. And so without the right native plants for those native butterflies, we don't have those butterflies and we don't have those caterpillars. Turns out that uh, for baby birds, about 90% of, of bird species uh, at a minimum extensively require uh, lots and lots of insects with caterpillars being the key of that to raise those baby birds, even if the adult birds eat the seeds. So if you don't have the right plants for the caterpillars, for the local butterflies, then you also don't get baby birds and the whole system kind of works together. And so by having the native plants in our yard, not only are we cutting down our water bills, but we're also supporting this whole ecosystem, including uh, native bees, which are more important pollinators uh, than the European honeybee that everyone thinks about, uh, have a significant lack of habitat in our urban areas, and they don't sting. So, you know, that's kind of an amazing thing. I could go on for that, about that forever, but we need to get going. So why would we want them in our gardens? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about an average morning uh, in my yard, which is different all throughout the year. Uh, doesn't matter what month of the year it is, uh, spring heading into summer during a heat wave, uh, fall, winter, there's always something going on in my yard, always something coming into bloom, going out of bloom. Uh, there's always some seeds available for the birds and my backyard is especially kind of just like a bird habitat. I live right in the middle of Pomona, uh, typical suburban Southern California. And it is amazing how the life that comes to my yard has changed since planting native plants. And it's, it's really doesn't even take that long, you know, within a year or so, uh, native pollinators, simplest of bird baths, just a ceramic dish that would go underneath a ceramic pot on a log, uh, all sorts of birds coming around, not just for the seeds, but for the water, all sorts of beauty all throughout the year. A little patch of our native narrow leaf milkweed in the back of the backyard so it can ramble all around because it's gorgeous part of the year and looks terrible part of the year. Uh, but my backyard is a monarch basically habitat uh, throughout most of the year. We always have monarch butterflies and lots and lots of caterpillars growing in our backyard. It's as simple as if you plant it, they will come in most of Southern California. Uh, things like bush sunflower, which you know, in the heat of uh, summer might go a little bit dormant, but as these uh, in inland Southern California, but as these uh, flowers dry out, not only is there kind of a, a strange and different sort of beauty to these dried flowers, these are bird feeders. And then the birds come in and eat the seed out of this. And so, you know, oftentimes I go out into my yard in the morning and there might be eight species of birds all kind of doing their things in different part of the garden. Uh, plants that provide nectar for butterflies. Just beautiful color. Lots and lots of lizards. I also have uh, fewer black widow spiders or brown widow spiders in my yard uh, than I think almost any yard I've spent time in in Southern California or talked to the gardeners. Uh, and I think it's because we have all these lizards that, uh, that are eating all sorts of different insects. Hummingbirds, many resident hummingbirds hanging out. All sorts of beauty as well as food for beneficial wildlife. So that's just a glimpse of kind of my backyard, your front yard, backyard, container garden on your balcony uh, might be different, but, but a little bit about kind of how I will interact on an average morning uh, with native plants. So why would we want them in our gardens? You know, I said earlier, native plants do more. So what do they do? Well, they provide beauty. Uh, let's, let's dismiss the notion right off the bat that native plants are not colorful, or that native plants need to look like the driest of chaparral or desert areas in the middle of summer. With just water once every month, maybe three weeks, depending on your soil, you can keep plants. You know, they don't, they don't look perfect in the summer. Uh, ecologically, summer is sort of our winter. It's when things are trained to sort of shut down when resources are scarce. Uh, but we can keep things looking pretty nice, pretty hydrated, and, uh, and just so much color, both from flowers, but also from leaves as well. And some of the textures and the fuzz of some of these plants, which is part of their drought adaptation, just makes them glow when the light hits them in a certain way. Uh, you can have something much more beautiful than, than a traditional kind of garden. Could be in pots. And with that, 
if you want to, you can have lots and lots of habitat. Uh, and you know, you're going to maximize your habitat if you go with the kind of higher plant density. Generally, that comes with a little bit of a wilder look. But you can also have a much more traditional garden. You can have more space between the plants if that's what what appeals to your aesthetic. Uh, you can do a little bit more pruning if you want, and you will still have so much more uh, habitat for birds, butterflies, and pollinators than a traditional landscape. Or you could really uh, kind of go for it and have something a little bit wild. And we'll talk later on about how do you balance a wild look in terms of the plantings with uh, these cues to let your neighbors know that you haven't just sort of uh, lost it. Uh, well, the concept is called cues to care, and it's a powerful one, and we'll talk about it later on. And, you know, with that, you put the plants in, you get all sorts of uh, birds, you put in some water, and then you might have something like this, uh, where this was sometime last year, one morning, I noticed all the birds in the backyard got quiet, looked out my window, and at the water feature, we had a Cooper's hawk looking around, uh, seeing if it could find itself a snack. Resource conservation is definitely part of it. Like I mentioned, most native gardens are only watered deeply once every three to four weeks. Once they're established, that's two years or so after planting. Uh, first year, you're going to be watering deeply about once a week and then kind of tapering off once things grow in. Uh, if you do your garden work yourself, it, it's actually a, a little bit easier to take care of, in, in my opinion. You know, you need to learn a little bit more because there's different plants. It's not just pushing a lawnmower. But one of the nice things is that most of these plants don't really need to be touched more than once or twice a year to care for them very well. And most of the trimming, pruning, and, and cleaning uh, happens in either the spring or the fall. You might do a, an early summer kind of cleanup, but, but most of that pruning is going to be in the spring or the fall when it's kind of nice to be outside. You, you are not going to need to be you know, pushing a lawnmower every week for an established native plant garden. And when you do do that care, most of it's just with kind of a, a hand pruner or maybe a loppers, you know, no, no need for polluting gas powered equipment. And all that together, the beauty, the habitat, the ease of care, the creating a yard you actually want to spend time in, that makes our spaces at home or in our communities or at our businesses where we'd be embracing native gardens and more enjoyable places to live and to learn. So I really like this quote from Lady Bird Johnson, former first lady, who was one of the first kind of on the national stage uh, native proponents uh, for embracing native plants within the built environment. Uh, and she said that native plants give us a sense of where we are in this great land of ours. I want Texas to look like Texas and Vermont to look like Vermont. And I'm a lot more cynical than Lady Bird, Lady Bird Johnson, uh, but my take is it costs a lot to live in California. And if I'm lucky enough to decide what's going to happen at a piece of land, then why would I want my yard to look like a parched imitation of essentially what's an East Coast landscape style, the lawn and roses or whatever in our country. And, and really that whole aesthetic evolved uh, from a rich European landowner aesthetic where they wanted to show off that they didn't even need to grow crops. They were so wealthy, they could just have a few sheep eating some you know blanket of grass. That has nothing to do with my life and how I want to live. Uh, personally, I would rather wake up to the natural beauty of California every day and then enjoy it every evening when I come home. And you can have that by planting a native landscape. Also gives your cat something really interesting to look at between all of the life that comes to the yard. So here are going to be some of our big guiding ideas as we get into uh, design. A garden is a living ecosystem. Even that turf and roses landscape is a living ecosystem, although it, it might be kind of unbalanced and, and out of whack a little bit. We have to put a lot of work into it to keep it that way. But every garden, to some degree, is a living ecosystem. There are lots of different things going on. And a garden is a process. Uh, that's, that's how I encourage you to think about a garden. It's a process. Things are living, growing. Sometimes there's something dying. And a, a true garden is never finished. It's, it's always in motion. Uh, and that's true of everything. You know, that's true of, of turf. It's always trying to grow, and you're always trying to mow it back. Uh, and a, a native garden or an ecological garden embraces that. It doesn't work against it like mowing a lawn. 
it embraces it and it understands it. And so what I am showing pictures of right here are spot in my yard that was planted way after the rest of most of my backyard was planted because it was the back corner of the landscape. I didn't have time to do the whole landscape at once or, or the funds to do that. And so, you know, you, we get to it when we get to it. And then on the right is a spot in my yard near the bird bath. And, you know, I thought that plant would work there, but turns out uh, even though I didn't tilt the bird bath in that direction, uh, it was soil stayed a little too moist. And so that plant died and this is a good chance to think, okay, was that the right plant for that spot? Probably not plant something else instead. Uh, that's all realistic, no matter how long you've been gardening for. And I encourage you to not get too, too hung up on your garden looking perfectly beautiful, all the plants looking amazing every day of the year. When we see pictures of beautiful gardens on Instagram or on the internet or in magazines, uh, you know, someone tends to think that those gardens look that way 365 days of the year, all that color, all of that beauty, every plant looks healthy. I have been to many, many, many beautiful gardens uh, fortunate to have traveled to gardens in, in many parts of the world. And I can tell you, every single garden has some plant that's not doing well, has some plant that's uh, declining for some reason, uh, is not that colorful year round. But when those pictures are taken, oftentimes it's a professional photographer, the lighting is perfect. Uh, it's known, you know, what week of the year that garden looks its best. And there's always going to be a dying plant, but they don't take the picture of that dying plant. They frame it as perfectly as possible. So don't hold yourself up to that standard. Loosen up some and you're gonna feel much more successful. Make it fun. Don't be stressed out about it. We're going to talk about so many different design principles uh, today. You don't need to absorb them all. Uh, don't be intimidated. If, if this just guides you to making some uh, plant selections for some more interesting plants that are easier to care for and more adapted and bring some birds to your garden, that's, that's a great starting point for success. And then you can integrate if you want more of these concepts as you go. Thinking this way is liberating. It makes gardening more fun and much more interesting. And so you can embrace the season. So for example, this is a picture of uh, the wildflower meadow in part of my backyard. And it's filled with color from early spring. It's still very colorful now, but by late summer and fall, this is what it looks like. And I wouldn't leave this up here if I was closer to the mountains and kind of in a wildfire danger area. But this, both in person when the light catches it, is beautiful in its own way. But much more than that, it's left like this because it's a bird feeder and we get tons and tons of beautiful birds coming and feeding on this. And then we get birds gathering nesting material and nesting in our garden. And so this doesn't match a, a typical, you know, picture of beauty. Uh, it wouldn't be in any, you know, garden design award magazines, but, uh, but there is a beauty to being in that space. So it can be whatever you want it to be. And then there's other spots. Like I wouldn't have that in my front yard. My front yard is, you know, more color throughout the year and kind of balanced. So whatever is going to work for you it doesn't need to be one thing. But when you think about your gardens in these ways, they can become based in this larger world of natural science, uh, curiosity, and that gives us a way to root our designs and our actions in the garden. And that helps make things more successful. But you might be thinking, okay, that sounds good. I'm on board with that concept, but where do I start? And the most important thing you can take from this is if you are not just kind of replacing a plant or two, but you're really thinking about designing a garden space. You don't start here. You don't start at the nursery, even if it's a really good nursery, because what happens when you start at the nursery is you get one of this, two of that, three of that thing, and you buy this one because it has a, a nice flower on it in the one gallon pot, but it's gonna be 12 feet tall and 12 feet wide. And you don't really have a space for it. And maybe too many things for full sun and you don't have that much full sun. It becomes a bit of a hodgepodge. And then that's harder for you to be successful with the maintenance and the care of it. And so we start by thinking through our design and we hit the nursery later. And then if you go to a specialty plant nursery, oftentimes the staff there can be quite knowledgeable. They can help you refine designs. Sometimes they can uh, recommend you know, alternatives, but go in with, with at least a bit of a plan if you are doing more than just kind of plopping in a few plants in, in a small area. So where do you start? Well, I suggest maybe going on a walk for some inspiration. And let me be clear, I don't want my front yard to look like this. Uh, 
you know, I like a pretty wild landscape, but this would be really wild for a suburban front yard. But there is so much uh, inspiration and so many ideas that can be taken by walking around in your local wild landscape and then taking some of those thoughts and observations and then letting those inform your design. So that's kind of what we are going to do together. We are going to uh, revisit a walk I took up above the San Gabriel Valley. This is uh, Upper Arroyo Seco going up above, if you're familiar with that area above Pasadena, Naltadena above the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. There's a beautiful uh, kind of canyon that goes up there and has all sorts of different uh, sorts of uh, ecosystem types from very dry areas, some very moist areas. And this is a walk that I took about uh, six or seven years ago now during our last quote historic drought. And I took a walk up there in August because I wanted to look at a wild, unirrigated ecosystem in the middle of August, in the middle of a historic drought, and see what's looking good out there as a as way to inform our, our built landscapes, what's keeping itself alive with no human work and surviving all right. And here's part of the key of why native plants uh, work so well for us. Certainly in these historic droughts, you, you do go out there and you do see individual plants suffering. But as a kind of group of species, these plants have evolved through terrible, terrible droughts before. So this is a uh, an image of basically a historical accounting of droughts in California all the way back to the year 800, which was reconstructed with tree ring records. And so you can see, interestingly, California became a state right around a very overall wet period. And then there was a significant drought, which changed a lot in California, uh, changed kind of the history of ranches and cattles, that drought over there. And now we're kind of headed back into what seems like a significant drought. But if you compare it to these historical kind of mega droughts in the tree ring record, these plants that we're talking about are locally adapted native plants as a species have survived that. And so putting them in our yards and you know watering them once a month after they're established, they are ready for that no matter what the weather is, as long as we select them well, and we will get into that. So important patterns to note from this walk. Look at plant density. Look at what's on the ground as well. So right when I started my walk, this is still just kind of getting into the trail area. And right next to a asphalt road with reflected heat in the middle of August is one of my favorite plants for home gardens, a California coffee berry, amazing habitat plant. No irrigation at all. Hasn't rained for many months. Super drought. And look at that, lush, green, doesn't have the look that someone would think of a native plant typically. Amazing plant, one of my favorites. Uh, California fuchsia, beautiful spring, late summer and fall flowering perennial. Looking okay there. A young coast live oak in this very marginal area, still coming up. Mountain mahogany, another incredible shrub that does well in home gardens in the right space. With these, a lot of these plants have fuzzy or thick leathery leaves that help them be adapted to very dry conditions. Uh, sacred datura, beautiful, beautiful plant, extremely toxic. So definitely not one to grow in, you know, a garden where, uh, where kids or animals might get to it, but gorgeous. And, you know, look at all that color, middle of a drought in August, uh, shrubs, evergreen shrubs in, you know, not only drought conditions, but growing in tiny slivers of soil. This one was facing west, looking perfectly happy. They're adapted. Native asters, toyon, another one of my absolute favorite plants. Uh, this can be turned into a small tree, uh, unfazed. Sugar bush, underrated native plant that I'm quite fond of, becomes a large shrub. California buckwheats, this is really one of the backbone plants, both for a wild ecosystems and for a low maintenance, low drama, very low care yard. Buckwheats would, would be one of the main shrubs, uh, credible plants or fuchsias. Then you walk into this coast live oak woodland and oh my gosh, natural air conditioning. There is no better place to be on a hot day than underneath the coast live oak. If you have room for one large tree in your yard in Southern California, this is probably the tree. I have a youngish one, but it's getting up there enough to cast shade uh, in my backyard. And 
sitting in a kind of a Adirondack chair underneath that tree, even on a very hot day, is the most comfortable place to be. And you can still kind of look out and see all the beautiful things going on in the yard. Manzanitas, look at that beautiful new growth, that beautiful bark. So many choices, even little seeds of California sagebrush, you know, still managing to come up in the drought. And so something that you probably noticed about plant density, unless it was growing out of a cliff face, a relatively high plant density. Uh, we don't need to have a plant separated by five to 10 feet from another plant with another eight feet of space in between and huge gaps uh, with gravel in between them to have a water-wise garden. If you want some breathing space in between your plants, that's fine, but we can have a lush, dense planting, which is very, very adapted to kind of how native plants want to grow. Uh, there is a density and the ground uh, has all sorts of different coverings. So in very dry areas, the ground tends to be almost more of decomposed granite with a few leaves. But in our woodland areas, there's lots and lots of kind of leaf litter that's built up. And so you can think about in your garden, both for the style as well as maybe what you'd put on the ground, maybe you could emulate that. Uh, so big important ideas for plant communities. This is an important concept. The plant community is more or less defined as a group of plants that you'll find you know, growing together pretty often. Uh, it can get much more technical than that, but for our purposes, that's just fine. Biggest idea for those of you in uh, the kind of Inland Empire through LA Basin area. Our area is not a desert. Uh, we are a Mediterranean climate. We are the most arid, the driest of all the Mediterranean climates in the world, which includes the Mediterranean, South Africa, uh, parts of Australia, where a lot of our other water-wise plants come from. Uh, but it's different from the desert. And so when we think about what the kind of sustainable landscape types are for our community, if you love the look of a desert garden, you can go ahead and do it. That's one of them. Uh, I love mixing some desert plants into my native gardens here in uh, Montclair where I work and in Pomona at my house because they bloom very well in the summer and have some lovely qualities. Uh, but our yards don't need to look like the yards in Tucson unless we want them to. Uh, so here are some of our local native plant communities. Oak Woodland, we just looked at this picture. And you know, seasonally, this is a picture from up above where I used to live in Altadena. And there are areas of oak woodland around here that once the shade canopy is there, there are summer dry ferns. There's even you know, mosses where the air is clean enough, uh, can have this lush space. If you want a, a lush space without a lot of water, plant some dry adapted large trees to grow in. And kind of here's that ground plane where it accumulates the, the leaf litter, the, the uh, branches the, that break down over time. Uh, there's kind of sparse, uh, grasses, a lot of these are not native grasses, but there's native grasses that do well in that and occasional shrubs and get this beautiful fungally rich soil. Most mushrooms are a good sign. Few of them are pathogens, but, but mostly it's probably a good thing if you see some mushrooms coming up in your garden. Uh, and so, yeah, that's something that you can uh, emulate, but in most cases, you're not going to want to plant an oak tree and then a sea of gravel right underneath it, because that's generally not how they grow kind of create their own rich system. Uh, on our steep slopes and a lot of our hills and mountains, we have chaparral. And here it's a combination of some oak trees with other trees and shrubs. But even here, look at that plant density. There are plants that are adapted to survive this even at high density. And then when you get closer walking through the chaparral, all sorts of beautiful moments. There's all sorts of different types of chaparral. This is a, a native clematis. Here is more of one dominated higher elevation, very chalky rock dominated by sages, buckwheats, and yuccas with a little bit of that more sparse space. So that could be something to emulate if you want a kind of more sparse spacing uh, or very dense. So this is another area where we have pines as well as uh, ceanothus. A beautiful backlit of mountain mahogany, gorgeous seed plumes. And so here I'm going to start to mix in some slides of some landscapes that I designed that had uh, kind of this approach of emulating an ecosystem. So here is one where uh, 
wanted to emulate chaparral in this very dry, sun-beaten place, especially until the young oak trees grow in, but didn't want really that height. This was kind of a, a spill-out space from an auditorium area, so we wanted to keep it kind of low and welcoming. And, you know, here, sometimes when you're in the chaparral, uh, you know, there's not, there's a lot of plant species total, but it's going to be dominated by a few different plant species. And you'll see those repeated. And that kind of creates a cohesive uh, sense of that ecosystem. And so choosing some dwarf varieties of a couple of different plants, uh, black sage and a California sagebrush with some grasses in the back, some Miss Canyon prints, and then working kind of on that repetition with then mixed in, there's different highlights and things that pop. Here kind of mixing uh, mixing a more formal non-native hedge with then these areas in between that are just a riot of native and there's some also non-native water wise plants in here but kind of really emulating the chaparral as well as there's other names for kind of the equivalent of chaparral in other mediterranean systems so chaparral a lot of shrubs and if you do it at home can be a lot of color and you can provide a little bit more space in between to have it look a less a little bit less chaotic if that's what you want Oak savanna, just in terms of the place that feels nice for me to be in, uh, oak savannas are absolutely amazing. Uh, trees that grow in, dotted with shrubs and perennials, but also just kind of a simple grassy ground plane. Uh, oftentimes people will have so many sh flowering shrubs that they like that they might not have room for this, but planting a couple of oak trees in your yard if there's room and keeping everything very simple around it. Uh, is a totally viable way to go and it'll take a while to grow in but can be gorgeous so here is a built landscape uh, from a landscape architect that i admire bernard trainer where they, he had existing oaks and a very high-end property but they just kind of restored this meadow with a few shrubs growing in and you know what more could you want from a landscape here is a, a close-up of a couple of flowering perennials from a small meadow that I put in at a place that I used to rent and so we kind of emulated that but there was a few mature existing fruit trees and then just in the kind of drier areas around. And a lot of the meadow plants could take that extra irrigation. So they kind of went into the fruit tree areas. We planted some native grasses. This is also a flowering perennial blue-eyed grass, uh, native ranunculus in the background. And so spots of color and created that kind of sense, even though our tree canopy uh, was not native. And, and a lot of people going into a native gardening situation might have existing trees as well that aren't native. That's often fine. And this could be a way to go. And then we have riparian, which basically means river or creek side. And that's not something that most people would put in because these plants want some water. But there is this beautiful sense of lushness. And then I really like this. This is from a hike I took in uh, San Diego, where you can see how right along the, the creek bed, there's this kind of sense of lushness. And then it gets very dry. And so if you think about, though, what you might set up if you put in a gray water system or if you set up an outdoor shower where that water can just run to some kind of more lush nearby plants and then it can go to your drier garden. That's probably going to be more stylized than this, but you can set up your own little riparian creek to reuse uh, that water on site. And so this is an example of a very simple kind of riparian-ish garden uh, that I had designed. And so you can kind of take inspiration from any plant community and start there if you want. And so I see kind of two main approaches and you can kind of mush them together if you want, whatever is gonna work best for you, but kind of two main approaches to starting to think about design. You can decide on a concept or a feel you want to achieve and then kind of match that to a, a native plant community, whether it's oak woodland or chaparral, then figure out the best plants to meet your goals. And kind of, you don't need to be super specific about it. So if you're thinking about, you know, if you're inspired by a walk in the chaparral or walk in the local oak woodlands where you live, then you might use some of those plants. But if you want to pull in some other plants you love from other parts of California into your native garden or either than other non-native plants, you know, that's just fine as well. Uh, no one's going to come to your house and judge you for that. Or if someone does, uh, you should tell them to just leave you alone. Uh, or your second kind of option, which sometimes uh, appeals more to people, is as you start researching native plants, you're going to fall in love with a bunch of plants. And you can kind of create your own plant community by making sure that you kind of fill the different niches. And so you're going to want hopefully a tree or two, if you have room, uh, some shrubs, some smaller plants, maybe some grasses. 
And you really focus on this concept that we'll get into more, putting the right plant in the right place. So doing your research will we'll provide you with a, a couple of different online resources that will have everything you need to do that. And making sure that, you know, if you have a sunny areas, then your shrubs or smaller perennial plants are going to do well in the sunny areas that right for the shady areas you have and, and you kind of create your own ecosystem and then you know observe it and go from there and so we can assemble our own resilient coherent landscapes by using the concept of plant communities in our designs it can be locally native species or any combination of plants with similar needs in your garden and so to kind of ground and then end uh this section this is an example of a uh native picnic area that I designed where I used to work at the Huntington Library and Botanical Gardens in San Marino, Pasadena area. And this was a, a pretty close emulation of we wanted it to feel like a native oak woodland once it grew in. Uh, but even though we planted these trees in, and these trees went in in boxes in a larger size than I would ever recommend for a home landscape. And, and part of the reason why is that, you know, once even you put a large box tree into a, uh, into a landscape space, it doesn't look that big. So, you know, if you plant small, they actually grow faster and tend to be more healthy, but we put these trees in, but still, you know, one day this will be a shade of, of oak woodland, but it's, it's pretty exposed right now. So even if you are uh, inspired by the woodland, you're going to be thinking full sun for quite a number of years. And so a combination of oak woodland plants that can survive the transition to shade and also ones that you would find in the sunnier areas where like the woodland opens up and then transitions back into more of a, a chaparral or kind of sage scrub. And so this just to show you how things can get growing in well if they get the right once a week deep establishment watering roughly once a week in most soils. Uh, here's February 2015. Plants laid out and going in combination of larger plants with some more space around them, shrubs, and then some smaller kind of detail plants on the end. And here's August of that same year. So especially the shrubs really kind of uh, get going. And so here you can see there's some space in between. Uh, this isn't quite as wild as a truly native, uh, truly wild landscape, but we have some repetition of some key plants. But tried to kind of have a, a stylized approach with still lots of our favorite plants, mostly local native plants, but then, you know, don't need to be too dogmatic about it. So this is a California native sage hybrid with beautiful purple flowers. That is not a local native, but it's gorgeous and uh, attracts hummingbirds and smells great and people love it. So we decided to add that into the mix. Uh, so here you can see things, some things get up and going right away. Some things take a little bit longer to get going. So here's sugar bush, which is actually a pretty decent growth rate, just not as, as uh, fast as some of the softer shrubs. And then integrated narrowleaf milkweed for the butterflies. If you're interested in supporting butterflies in Southern California, this is the easiest milkweed to grow. It spreads all over the place if it's happy. It's a great one for the bottom of the backyard. It could be a little bit hard to manage in the front yard. Uh, but if you can find a space for it, you will be supporting monarch butterflies. And then also bringing in some cultivars. So for example, this is a native aster variety, which is really variable in terms of how it, uh, it grows the species. Uh, it could be taller, it could be leggier, uh, but there is a specific one called silver carpet available in the nursery. So we use that one. So we know that'll be a nice low ground cover. Uh, even in gardens with professional gardeners, if you plant a whole garden, something's going to die. Uh, it's just part of that process that I mentioned. Don't beat yourself up over it. Ask yourself, was it the right plant in the right place? And if it was, sometimes stuff happens and you can try again. If maybe it wasn't, you can try something else. And so that's just kind of one example of using a kind of plant community based approach as a way to ground uh, a coherent garden design. And then one of the ways for especially a first time gardener to have a better chance of success, whether you're emulating a plant community or creating your own is don't choose too many different plants. Avoid one of this and one of that and one of this and one of that. Uh, in a, if you have a just a container garden space, then maybe you would do that. But for an in the ground landscape, uh, having some key plants that repeat and then maybe the shrubs or the tree are accents and, and you know, that, that's really a, a, 
a way to help yourself be successful. You don't need 172 different plans. And then one other kind of guiding principle that I really like that I got from Mike Evans, who uh, runs Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano, an amazing native plant nursery that does all sorts of workshops and education as well, is he's really big on recommending that people create a story or even a narrative concept for your garden to really guide uh, what you're thinking about as you pull in different plants. And beyond the plants, what do you want it to feel like? And so I didn't really think about this intentionally in words ahead of time, but then I asked myself, you know, about my property, you know, what, what is my story? And I realized that uh, the front yard is a native woodland or will be when things grow in. That is something that I knew ahead of time. I wanted to have the feel of a native woodland, but I didn't have room to put in a, a huge oak tree. So I used some large shrubs uh, and kind of have that feel. Our whole house, we decided we kind of want to be a bird blind. And so we have bird baths and uh, branches that we put in as perches to see right out of the windows. And, and so we get to see lots of bird action coming and going. And if you set your native garden up like that, you'll actually see many more birds generally when you're inside the house, because some of them are kind of wary when you're outside, unless you've been sitting down and really you know, kind of calm and quiet for a while. And then our backyard is a native plant collection. Uh, primarily, we have a whole bunch of different species. My partner is a native, uh, is a, uh, professional horticulturist as well. And so that's kind of what we're into is learning about different plants. And, and we've gone through great pains to try to have a still a sense of a garden and not just one of this and one of that whilst having a ton of diversity. Then we have fruit trees, but underneath it, we have a bunch of native meadow plants that don't demand, but can tolerate uh, the water that the fruit trees get and provide a lot of habitat for pollinators and butterflies. And we also have a vegetable garden. We're not only about native plants, we love growing our own food as well. We're very lucky that we have a uh, relatively large lot for a suburban area. We bought a total fixer upper because of the size of the lot and it turned it into this garden that you will see some more pictures of later on. But also remember in all of those considerations, if gardens are also habitat for people, like the people who live or uh, work there in the case of a business, then they need space for people as well. So, you know, a, a common mistake for that sometimes people make is that they'll the section of their landscape that they're redoing, they'll take out a lawn and they'll put in just wall to wall shrubs. Uh, and if that's what your goal is, then that's great. But the convenient thing about a lawn is that you can walk anywhere or set up chairs or folding tables anywhere, do whatever you need to do. And so if you are moving over to a more native garden style, remember to paths so you can walk through and enjoy your garden and also uh, do your maintenance and patio spaces whether they're built up like this or i also am fond of just the wood chip mulch for free wherever you can get it and a couple of cheap lawn chairs uh there but then surrounded by your plants it doesn't need to cost an arm and a leg so remember space for yourself so you can be out there and enjoy it all and with that, let's go to our first question period where uh, I will look at the questions that came in in the Q&A so far. We only have a couple and then we'll keep going. Uh, okay, so the first one is a comment and the second one was just asking how big is my property? Uh, and I don't mind answering that. It's about one third of an acre. Uh, so our garden is probably about a quarter of an acre. Uh, and so, yeah, the property is a little over 13,000 square feet. I think it's pretty big for a suburban property. It's the biggest one in my neighborhood. Uh, kind of a typical 1950s uh, tract house. But the, this lot happens to be on a cul-de-sac. And for whatever reason, uh, we have a huge backyard because uh, there's a small front yard. The house is pretty far up. And then this, this lot that we have just got like the leftover space of all these weird angles uh, as the cul-de-sac was kind of meeting the development uh, next to it. And so it wouldn't be very good for, you know, developing more units or whatever, uh, but great for putting a garden in. So that's kind of a little bit about my yard. Uh, how do I recommend learning the names of plants or plant ID tips? Uh, good question. Uh, I'll show you some online resources. I'd say repetition, writing things down, 
uh, taking lots of pictures on your phone. And then there are there are a couple of apps. Uh, one of them is called uh, Seek. And then also even built in in the iPhone recently, I noticed that if you take a picture of a plant, sometimes there'll be like a little uh, dot icon when you look at the picture that you can press and it launches a plant ID thing. It's not always perfect. Sometimes it just gives you like the genus or group of plants and not the species. Uh, the other thing you can do if there's a plant that you know you want or you need to know more about it is you can uh, take a picture and then go to where local native plant nursery and I'll provide you with the list and show someone there and they could probably ID it for you. Uh, visiting botanical gardens or demonstration gardens. If you're anywhere near us in Montclair, for example, uh, you can come visit us. Most of the plants in our demonstration garden are labeled. There's a few that aren't right now because I am working on a new label order, but even then you can take a picture and come in and, and ask a staff member and we could try to help you out. Uh, but just kind of immersing yourself in it. And you know, you don't always need to remember all the names, just write down the names and do the best you can. If you write them down, you can always look it up later and find a picture online. Uh, okay, so we have some specific questions about gophers and fruit trees and native plants and things like that, removing uh, things that, that aren't, uh, I'll loop back to those and answer those later for the ones I won't, uh, for the ones I won't be able to answer as I go. But for now, you know, we could spend the rest of this whole workshop time uh, talking about all the different topics that came in on the Q&A. So I'm gonna hold those off until towards the end. Uh, and I'll be focusing on questions related to, uh, related to for that. Uh, there's one question that might be relevant uh, from Margaret. Do you keep the plants in a bunch together? I normally keep them even left and right. Uh, if you could retype the question, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at by that, Margaret. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so let's keep moving on. Quick note, you're going to see as we get into more uh, pictures of examples, many of them have a credit to the Theodore Payne Foundation's Native Plant Garden Tour. So I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, Theodore Payne Foundation is a great nonprofit based in Sun Valley in the San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles area, uh, dedicated to uh, the promotion and preservation of wildflowers and native plants. And a lot of what they do is through urban horticulture. So every spring they have a garden tour where it's usually two days all over different parts of Los Angeles where a number of gardens kind of open up and you can go visit them. Really worth checking out. Uh, but also on their specific website for their garden tour, native garden, nativeplantgardentour.org, they have archives of beautiful pictures of many of the gardens from the last years of the uh, tour. So lots of inspiration there. So we're gonna dive into basic elements of garden design. And these all work well with native gardens, but not limited to native gardens. A lot of these are just elements of garden design. Uh, probably if you asked you know, 10 different people involved with garden design, what their top list of things to be is, you know, there'd be some overlap and some differences. So this is just not the only way to design a garden, but but one, one take on the most important concepts. Uh, if some of this is overwhelming, don't worry about it for now. You could perfectly have a nice planting without uh, worrying about each one of these things. But the more you can absorb, uh, the, the more tools you'll have in your toolkit. So one of the first elements to be thinking about, even before you're choosing plants, we're going to be talking about a lot of different things before we talk about choosing plants, is landform. Uh, the elevations, the dips and bumps in the landscape, where it's lower, where it's higher, a uh, typical suburban lot is either pretty flat or oftentimes there might be a little bit of slope from one direction to another. Can you use that? Can you accentuate it? Landform also has to do with what happens with the water because the water is always going to head towards the lower spot uh, when it rains. And landform could be the key towards if you have areas that flood on your property or areas where you want to move water or hold water, how to do that. It can also change your perspective alter drainage, all that sort of stuff. And so this is intentionally a very in-progress picture of my backyard where we had a slight drop kind of from the house 
uh, just kind of dropping down in this direction as you go away from the house further into the backyard. And what we decided to do, we had some terrible drainage problems in the front yard. And so we put in this kind of system that passively just using gravity took advantage of that slope, brought the rainwater around. And then this is in construction, digging a dry stream bed that fills a series of very small pools. And then finally will overflow into this sunken native carrick, so grass-like plant meadow, which doesn't need a lot of water but then can take even inundation and flooding. And with all of the extra soil from digging this down more, kind of heap that up on the uphill side and created this terrace with this series of little uh, planting beds. So instead of the water, even when it's being watered or when it rains kind of just moving away, it kind of lingers and these plants get the use of it. And then there's a couple of small plants in here. We added more over time. There's some just wildflower seed that we tossed out. And so if you're interested in how maybe you would set up a whole system that does that and how to plan that out, check out our rainwater harvesting for home landscapes workshop. I normally teach that in the winter, so a number of months off. But again, on our YouTube uh, online workshop recording page, there is a recording of an online version of that that kind of walks you through all of that. And we actually use this as a case study. Here's another uh, picture of this is kind of a smaller side yard. And here, uh, harvesting water, I think this was from a downspout at the house, it would come around into this small dry stream bed where you can see here there is also a little bit of a slope that way and so to be able to hold on a little bit more water to more water as they dug this out they mounded up the soil on the downslope side and so it kind of adds to the water holding capacity down in this dry stream bed room for the side path to go through here and then some beautiful shrubs which they i'm sure just did a little bit of clipping throughout the year to keep this open an important thing if you're doing something like that is make sure that you'll know where the water is going to overflow because you never want to build up something so big here where it could go back to the foundation of the house. Here it probably will go and will just overflow into the driveway well before it would back up towards the house. So that's kind of landform. Uh, again, way more on the rainwater harvesting for home landscapes workshop about landform because a lot of the function of, of landform is related to where water is going to go. Uh, Another thing that you might do with landform to consider is if you have heavy clay soil but are trying to get away with uh, some plants that maybe want better drainage than you have, kind of mounds and slopes will, will help you avoid a situation where uh, water is going to settle and make things even worse for the plants you're trying to grow. There's plenty of native plants well adapted to clay soil and we'll talk about that later on and where to find those lists if that's your situation. Uh, other basic elements of design to understand exposure, which is the amount of sun and shade, very important if your plant wants full sun, that's six or more hours of direct sunlight. It doesn't need to be set up to sundown. If you're growing plants inland and you see that something wants full shade, that pretty much means no direct sun in the summer, pretty much any part of the day or the plants might burn, which is only a small amount of the plants we might grow. And then microclimates. Microclimates are any particularly hot or cold areas in your yard. So for example, uh, especially in our inland climate, you know, it's, it's pretty hot overall. But then if you have, for example, like a narrow planting bed where your driveway is on one side and there's a stucco wall of the house on the other side and it faces the west so it gets the afternoon sun, that area is going to be super extra hot. And so think about that. And that's going to be somewhere to put plants that really, really can take that heat. And in situations like that, sometimes even though we're not a desert, I'll use plants from the California desert because we're kind of increasing and concentrating that heat beyond kind of normal local conditions where our local native plants, some of our local native plants will thrive in that, no problem. Uh, but you can put also mix in some desert plants and really get some beautiful summer blooms out of all of that heat. Or even if you are interested in growing succulents, whether they're native or non-native, uh, some of the cacti grow great in that situation. So things to think about for those very hot Western facing backed up against a wall, asphalt reflected heat sort of situations. Now there's also the cooler or moister microclimate. So anywhere that's shaded from an existing tree uh, is gonna be a cooler microclimate. Uh, here in the shade of uh, on the north side of a huge grapefruit tree that was existing in my backyard, we put a, a small water feature that's a, a galvanized kind of water trough 
you can get from somewhere like Tractor Supply Company, uh, just connect an extension cord to a little cheap uh, fountain pump and uh, put some milk crates in and have some native water plants. And this feature itself doesn't, it just gets topped off you know, every couple of weeks. It doesn't actually use a lot of water, especially in the shade, but it creates this cooler, moisture microclimate where some of the other plants we love where the this yerba buena this plantain these would not do well in full blasting sun in my front yard but uh, do incredibly well in this little microclimate another key concept to be thinking about is repetition repeating at least some of the plants and especially in a uh, front yard where you're going to be embracing a native sort of look especially if you're the first native landscape in your in your neighborhood you may or may not care what the neighbors think about your front yard but if you do want people to, to understand that something like this is a garden having some very, very colorful plants at least part of the year and then choosing to repeat them can kind of be a cue that this is an intentionally designed space even if it's on the wild side so i really like uh this image these small sulfur buckwheats you can see this repetition this one two, three, you know, that's not something that randomly is going to happen in an abandoned yard. Here you can see there's also a little bit of repetition just out of the frame, just, just coming into bloom. This Winifred Gilman sage will be covered in purple before long. And then there's one more of them over here, helping kind of balance things out. And then this is a different sage, but with similar flowers. Uh, so you can see some elements and then some elements are kind of looser and more wild. So repetition. We also talked about that in terms earlier in terms of not having 172 different plants, but having some key shrubs that you tend to repeat. Taking it to the next scale, repetition can become massing where we're using many, many repetitions of the same key plant and then maybe mixing in some other accents. And sometimes that's all you need. So here, uh, this is the entrance to the Huntington Library. And here I selected, there's some existing trees, uh, not native, but water-wise, made the transition just fine. And just repeating this striking deer grass over and over and over as kind of the matrix for this whole area. Uh, great plant, goldfinches come and eat all the tiny seeds out, only needs to be cut back every two or three years. And then just kind of subtly tucked in here were some native buckwheats and sages, which like this time of year, they're cut back and you don't even notice them that much. And then they would, when they come up and into bloom, then they become much more noticeable amongst the deer grass. Not all plants are great for massing. This happens to be one that is. And then on the micro scale, uh, an element of surprise, and this could be either something built or it can be like this Dudleya where we have this uh, little wall. This is actually that little retaining wall that you saw earlier where we had created the sunken area where all the water accumulates. And then perched up above that, tucked into that wall, we just took a little four inch uh, Dudleya, our California native, one of our California native succul succulent plants, uh, and just tucked it in there in a part shade area. And kind of if you're walking the path and turn around that area, it's just one little kind of surprising detail tucked in there. It doesn't need to be a huge thing, but it's just kind of a, an extra little kind of thought about element. And oftentimes those, you might not even worry about designing those in at the beginning, but over time you'll find little places where you can add one little element uh, here or there. Starting to talk about planting design as well we have texture. Texture in some ways is more important than flower color because texture is going to be happening every day of the year. And by texture, it's kind of the feel of the plant visually in terms of the size of the leaf, the laciness versus the fullness. Here you can see an example of different textures. We have the lacy, uh, ferniness of the native yarrow, the broadness of the hummingbird sage leaves, the strappy narrow leaves of the deer grass, the kind of billowy texture of the showy penstemon, and then the more kind of structural shrub of the island cheekering sage in the background. So working with a contrast of textures, plants with narrow leaves next to plants with wider leaves, that helps both of them visually pop more. Now, if you're not concerned about the visual part and you're just mostly guided by habitat, 
you know, you can not worry about that if that's, you know, one too many things to worry about. But if you're very guided by the visual parts of it, you can also choose lots of native plants and think about the visual aspects. And then you're still, if you're working with native plants, going to have a great habitat garden. Or if you're one of those people who really wants to think about it all, you can think about it all. So here's another example of texture uh, with the grasses. The grasses are a great way to provide kind of additional texture in the gardens and the grasses. And then color as well. And then with color, I also think leaves are more important than flowers. We have so many different leaf colors from almost white to grays to dark greens to mid-tone greens with our California native plants that that kind of color contrast is going to be happening 365 days a year. And then the flowers will come and go. But you know, for some people who are really, really sensitive to color, you know, if you want to think, well, I want a purple plant next to a uh, blue flower plant next to a pink flower plant, or what, like you can do that. But for the average person, I'd say think more about the leaf color, the texture for the visual elements. And then if you put plants in where you're going to have something flowering, you know, most of the seasons of the year, every season of the year, again, those will be in the later resources. In most cases, the colors are just gonna kind of work themselves out. I'm, I embrace all sorts of different colors. I don't worry about that. To me, that's like one extra thing that in most cases, I don't wanna worry about. I think about the flower season. I think about all these other things. I let the color work itself out. Because even in situations like this, where if someone was thinking, well, I don't wanna put too many purple plants next to each other. Well, here's two purple plants next to each other, but the purples are different and there's still some contrast. And in terms of you know, visually, the way I see it, I, I think this is still quite lovely. Now moving into kind of a more functional concept, you might hear this term hydrozone and you don't need to remember that term uh, if that's technical intimidating, don't worry about it. But the concept is group plants with similar moisture or irrigation needs together. And as simple as that's going to sound to some of you, to others of you, because I know just from teaching this stuff, people will think, I never thought of that. And that's one of the keys to uh, plant success. And that overlaps into design as well, because you want your plants to be kind of happy and healthy uh, to have them look good. And so the reason why I show this picture for hydrozones is this is a garden that I just drove by one day that I thought was lovely in Pasadena area. And you can see there's a couple of high water use plants here. Here's a Japanese maple and a hydrangea, but they're together in a shady area in the corner of the garden where they can easily get their extra supplemental water together. And then the rest of the garden is a combination of native and other water wise plants, which grow very well together with similar moisture needs. If you put either of these plants right in the middle of this part of the landscape, either the whole landscape would have to get over water to keep them happy or these would never be happy. And even with native plants, most native plants are gonna be happy with being watered um, just once a month, maybe once every three weeks after they're established. But there's some native plants that require a bit more water and either put those together, irrigated separately, or have them close to a hose bib where you can just kind of supplementally water them every once in a while. Kind of just think it through. Uh, and it's easy to do that research. Here's another example. Uh, this is my parents' front yard in Van Nuys, west facing full blasting heat. Front yard is part of it's recently replanted, combination of native and water wise plants mostly, but we also wanted to grow a couple of citrus trees and a pomegranate, all of which to produce fruit well and be happy are going to require a bit more water than the natives, quite a bit more water than the natives. And so here we hydrozoned, not by having them next to each other, but by having two different valves that run drip irrigation system. And so the main area is watered much less often on one valve. And then just right in the immediate root zone of the fruit trees, kind of from the edge of the canopy in, uh, there's another valve and that water is a little bit differently. So I don't recommend uh, just uh, drip irrigation in 100% of situations. It's about what's going to be the best irrigation system for you. We have lots of other workshops that go deeper into irrigation. Uh, but here, that's a way that we can still do that hydrozoning concept, even though the fruit trees are kind of interspersed some in the landscape. Next concept is 
plant density. Plant density can be a little bit intimidating for people who are new to working with gardens. And, and I've noticed that a lot of people have a tendency to default to a plant, a bunch of space around it, a plant, a bunch of space around it, a plant, a bunch of space around it. And there are perfectly appropriate situations for that. One, if you just know that that's the look that you like, then I'm not going to judge you. Go for it. Uh, one of the reasons why I show this picture, which is a combination of native and dry but not native species, is that here is another example of uh, low plant density, very appropriate. This parking strip right here, this is actually a, uh, not a main street, but a pretty busy uh, through passing side street. And there's lots of people that are gonna be parking here and walking out of cars. And so having this kind of more open area with decomposed granite and accented by some rocks and just kind of sparse plantings here and there, that allows the function of people to walk through it who may or may not be looking out for the plants. Great reason to have low plant density. Uh, beyond that, though, you do want to leave space to go through and, and do your maintenance, and you want to respect the space a plant needs. You know, don't plant plants that are going to get six feet wide, two feet apart from each other. Uh, but in general, I recommend that people default to, if it's not a pathway area or a patio space, allow those plants to grow together for a couple of reasons. One, if there are not plants there, then weeds are most likely going to try to grow there. And then you'll have to manage those. Shading the area and having the plants be there is going to be an easy way over time to have a little bit less weeding to do. Two, uh, oftentimes the look ends up being a little nicer than just a plant, a plant, a plant, a plant. And then three, for the habitat purposes of it, having some amount of that plant density, at least in some areas, gives much better cover for birds and lizards and potential places for birds to nest, especially in like a medium to tall sized shrub layer somewhere on your property. So here's an example of a landscape that is kind of high plant density, but look, they leave this nice pathway through. You can tell that they've done some pruning to keep the pathway open. And then that's balanced by the higher density out in the landscape. That makes sense to me. Uh, here is kind of very high plant density. Sometimes, you know, this would look a little bit less dense if it wasn't for all the California poppy wildflowers, which I'm sure reseed themselves every year. But if you want to go with a lower plant density, which is just fine, I'd say just have a plan. Don't, don't just have those be abandoned spaces, at least for the purposes of design in between the plants. Uh, think through what that'll look like. If you want some more space between your shrubs, maybe you can work with grasses or smaller perennial plants or working with stone or some uh, branches or things like that. That will also enhance the look and the habitat features of the garden. And I will say that this uh, beautiful landscape designed by uh, the director of horticulture at the Theodore Payne Foundation, some of these plants are going to grow in more and will be higher density over time. But just as a kind of guide as to what, you know, like a beautiful somewhat lower plant density uh, area might look like in a garden, I think this is quite lovely. This is another picture of that same landscape. And so you can see the the texture, the rocks, the the branches really kind of enhance. And then a, just a smattering of wildflower seeds as well with poppies. And then these are clarkias, which would start blooming pink flowers soon after that. If you do want a very low density, uh, one of the keys to having that still look and feel like a garden is have some height, have some trees or large shrubs that are limbed up into trees. And that way, you know, underneath it can be pretty sparse, just a couple of plants here or there with some rocks, uh, but it's not like an open abandoned space. This is not a, a native plant garden, but I thought it was a decent example of the concept. And then speaking of taller plants, remember to put trees in your design, whether they're tall trees or small trees. If you have room for trees, uh, don't skip those. A lot of people are afraid of trees these days. They, they, have an impression that trees will destroy their sewer line. Uh, and that is usually not the case. Uh, part of the case and why that reputation is, is around these days is because for houses, many of our houses in Southern California were built in the 1950s, kind of when the suburban explosion happened. And for those houses from that era or older who have their original clay leaking 
sewer lines, uh, any large plant or tree is going to find a leaking sewer line and exploit that moisture. Uh, that is just the case. But if your sewer line has been redone since then, which many houses have, and it's it's a modern uh, sealed sewer line, then you know, I wouldn't put an oak tree right on top of that sewer line uh, in case it, you know, worst case scenario, it blows down in a huge wind event one day. But for the most part, the, the trees, they exploit uh, leaking things already because there's moisture there. But if your sewer line is not leaking, you're going to be all right. Uh, and then same thing with like lifting concrete or patios. You know, I wouldn't necessarily put a huge tree right next to the sidewalk or right next to your patio. But oftentimes the problems with the roots are because traditionally those trees were growing in lawn. And when the lawn is only being irrigated to three inches deep, all the roots are going to be right there at the surface. But working with how we irrigate our California native landscapes, which is very occasional and then deeply, that's not only going to be better for the health of the tree, it's also going to train those roots to go down deep and be much less to no problem up at the surface. And so here's an example of a couple of smaller trees that I really like. The manzanita is a large bush. There's a couple of great uh, varieties of manzanita. They don't grow particularly quickly, but they're worth it over time because they're gorgeous. Uh, Bird Hill is a, a common larger manzanita. Dr. Hurd is another one, very similar to each other. And then Catalina Island Cherry is another great one, which will get pretty tall, 25 to 30 feet, but not that wide. So great to be on like the west side of a patio space like this to get some afternoon shade in the, the late afternoon, early evening. But without a lot of uh, without a lot of care. Here, this is a hot street in the Lincoln Park area of Pomona, and they planted just a whole row of native western red buds up on a little mound that then with some rocks and some native grass underneath, and you know took a decent amount of pruning to train them like this, but they're not huge things. You, know, you don't need a chainsaw or anything like that. And on a hot day, walking down this section is not only beautiful, it feels so much cooler. Aesthetically, sometimes a tree makes all the difference as well. Here's a, here's a simple restricted plant palette, uh, front yard landscape in Claremont with a little bit more space in between. And that's just fine. Uh, this kind of forms almost like a default walkway to, to walk through here. So repetition of some buckwheats, coyote brush, some sages for accents, but this tree really kind of forms the backdrop and also gives a little bit more privacy for the house out of these windows. Uh, the, the design, you know, there's be some nice plants, but I think the design really is, is helped by this tree. And if you have room for an oak tree, uh, absolutely, you know, plant one, the shade underneath an oak tree, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and beautiful to be in. This is uh, Andreas Hessing's house. He is the owner and designer of Scrub J Studios, which is mostly active, I believe, in the San Gabriel Valley and on the Theodore Payne Foundation tour every year, I think. Uh, gorgeous, gorgeous garden. If you ever have a chance to go check out this garden, if you go on the Theodore Payne Foundation tour, uh, Hessing Garden in Altadena, go do that. Beautiful, beautiful garden. And kind of patio spaces. There's a Desert Museum Palo Verde tree. It's become a very popular tree these days. Here, maybe it's a little bit close. I don't know if I, I would recommend doing it right in you know this close to the concrete, but makes a great, great patio scale tree here shading this courtyard. It's another example of a mature coast live oak. It kind of creates a whole microclimate ecosystem underneath it. And then also remember that trees are very important to more than just humans, especially especially oak trees. But any tree structurally becomes a place for birds to nest and to hang out. An oak tree, if you have room for just one large tree, is especially good because there are many, many, many species of caterpillars that will use oak trees and you won't even notice them. But then that becomes bird food. They become favorite places for birds to nest. I'll often have, uh, even in my immature oak tree in my backyard, I'll have six, seven species of birds in it at the same time. In the evening, I see birds flying back into it to sleep. Uh, really, really great places. So here's some uh, goldfinch, hummingbird, mockingbird, all just hanging out in my oak tree at home. 
But remember, when you plant trees, it's going to take some time. So plant now. Remember, it's still going to be sunny. So it's going to be a full sun garden. Uh, but you might choose some species that then can take the transition from full sun to part shade. So when you're looking at plant resources and plant lists, if you're planting right next to your tree, uh, plants that are listed as either full sun or part shade will be good choices to go with so that uh, they can be happy through that transition. And so we've talked about a lot of concepts. Uh, you uh, might be overwhelmed at this point in time. If so, take a breath. Don't worry. You don't need to integrate every single one of these concepts into your design, or you don't need to you know, do them all fully, or you can go back and rewatch the workshop recording when you're ready to absorb more concepts. But I do want to take a moment for this last one, because it is a pretty useful one if you're thinking about a front yard landscape, especially if you're the first native yard on your block. And this concept is called cues to care. It was developed by an academic researcher, Joan Nassauer, who is, was a landscape psychologist. Basically, she studied what makes people think what they do about landscapes. And she became very interested in front yard restoration landscapes in a very different ecosystem type uh, where prairies were the native ecosystem. And people were starting to do these prairie restoration front yards. And in some installations, in some areas, uh, the neighbors thought they were beautiful, you know, great things to be going in in the neighborhood. And in other ones, people were calling code enforcement, saying people just abandoned mowing their lawn and these, these gardens are taking down property values and, and they need to be dealt with. And so she did this big study where she created different visualizations of similar native landscapes with just one or two different elements changed. And long story short, she came up with basically a conclusion that sounds very intuitive, uh, but then she had the good reasons behind it. And the conclusion was that even if people don't know what's going on with the plants, they tend to like or at least accept landscapes that they understand somehow are cared for and intentional. And they tend to not like landscapes that they think are abandoned or not taken care of. And she realized that that can come down to what she called cues to care. So in those prairie restoration front yard landscapes, that was as simple as like a well-maintained path going through this wild landscape. Or because prairies are grasses and small perennials, uh, sometimes they would do like a mowed edge and then it'd be wild on the inside or a, a picket fence around it kind of containing it. Those would all be those cues that even if someone doesn't know what's going on with plantings, you know, this is an intentional space. And so I really like in terms of a, a native garden, this San Fernando Valley front yard is something that shows those cues to care. Uh, if you took this front yard landscape, which is quite wild, lots of shrubs, especially from the street because it's mounted, lots of lots of stuff going on. Uh, if you took this and if you removed the, the split rail fence and the little piles of rocks, which in this neighborhood didn't just end up there by accident, uh, the kind of the pavers that are put in in various places, if you removed all of that, that would look even wilder. But with this wild planting, all of that shows that there's some care. And especially when you get around to this section, you know, that path is cared for. Even though these shrubs are very wild, uh, there's some kind of wider shrubs than would normally perfectly grow in this space. So there's been some nice pruning and this path is not all overgrown. It's well-maintained. When you look, this creates a nice kind of split level and then this is mounded and there's this nice little dry stacked uh, flagstone wall. So these are those cues to care that help this wild garden look very uh, intentional. And I think it works quite well. And you can see here, uh, there's a existing crepe myrtle, uh, which survives the transition to a water wise or native garden very well. And I do believe these people probably sit in these chairs and enjoy the newspaper on a regular basis and probably talk to the neighbors more than they did when this was all just lawn out here. And it's really something that adds to the community, even though it's a kind of wild looking landscape by using those cues to care. So let's take a break and see if we have any questions that came in. From Barbara, where can I find the online resources that you mentioned? We are going to have a whole section for that later on. So just hold on. Uh, from Elizabeth, does deer grass like to be planted near sugar bush? No problem with that. Uh, should be just fine. I did show some water basins, so I will 
uh, answer that quickly. How do you control mosquitoes in water basins? So in the, uh, the galvanized one that I showed, there are actually uh, mosquito fish living in that, which uh, it was like flipping a light switch when we put those in. Before we put those in, we are having to use uh, this product called Dunks, which have uh, a BT. It's a natural bacterial extract in it, which uh, you wouldn't want to get on caterpillars. I would not recommend you know using it. Sometimes people will spray it in their garden as a quote organic pesticide. I wouldn't recommend that because that could be really bad for caterpillars and butterflies. But put it comes in a cake and just put it into the water where there's not going to be caterpillars in that water. Uh, that disrupts something in the uh, the maturation cycle of mosquito larva into uh, flying adult mosquitoes. So that so that is effective. Uh, but if it's large enough water to have uh, mosquito fish in it, then that's extremely effective as well. And then for things like bird baths or those uh, dishes that I showed, those just for uh, sanitation because birds have no decency and will poop in their own water uh, should be. Uh, cleaned out uh, daily, just kind of dumped out and, and refreshed with water and uh, scrubbed out at least weekly, if not more often. And a mosquito takes 72 hours to go from a larva to an adult. So if those are getting cleaned out regularly enough, you'll never have mosquitoes in those. Uh, so lots of questions about recommended methods for removing grass. That's a whole other workshop. Uh, this is about native landscape design, but we have that resource. So if you go onto our YouTube page uh, that has our workshop playlist, which if you scroll up on the chat, you can find it at the top, cbwcd.org slash YouTube. We have a whole recorded workshop on there called Removing Your Turf the Right Way, which is mostly about all the top recommended uh, ways for removing grass, the time to do it, and tips and techniques for doing that. So check that out. I'm going to be teaching it uh, live online upcoming uh, in the, I believe, mid to late summer. Uh, so that will be going up onto our schedule uh, pretty soon. We're about to upload our next six months of workshop descriptions and signups, uh, but that's already uh, recorded online for you to get into that because there is, uh, you can do it, but there, there are a lot of tips, techniques, and stuff to learn that go beyond what we can cover here. Uh, so, okay, follow up. One last question about mosquitoes. I thought that as long as the water was moving, mosquitoes can't breed. Is that correct? So if there is enough water movement, that will be correct. However, what I have found is that for like a, a small fountain, kind of like recirculating home kind of things, oftentimes there's not there's not a, enough water movement. So for example, like that trough water feature that I showed, uh, that's what I was hoping for at first when I set it up, but it wasn't enough water movement to prevent mosquitoes from, from having larva like at the edges. And so that's when we moved into those other techniques. So if you do have moving water, you can always try it, but just learn what mosquito larva look like and watch out for them. And then you'll have a couple of options for if they do show up. Okay, so let's go through some garden elements and then we will take uh, probably a little while, let's get through the garden element section and then we will uh, take a break before we delve into our design examples, which will also include those resources for selecting your plants. So garden elements. Well, if you like the kind of traditional lawn and shrubs sort of look, it can be done. Uh, it's going to take more work to do the clipping and things like that and keep the plants all separated, uh, but it can be done. And so this is an example from the Theodore Payne Foundation Native Plant Garden Tour. When this lawn of yarrow is not in bloom, it's just kind of low and green. Keeping something like this, this yarrow section is probably on separate irrigation. It is going to take a little more water, but it can be done. The habitat value, if that's part of your motivation, is not going to be quite as high with all the kind of trimming and clipping to keep things like this. However, if this is what you like, like I said earlier, this the habitat value of this is going to be night and day way, way higher than uh, probably the, the turf dominated landscape that it replaced. It will take quite a bit more work, but it can be done if that's the look you like. Or container plants, you know, if if what you have is a, a paved patio space or a rental where you can't plant in the ground, you can have a, a great native plant collection. Uh, 
in containers. Here, this uh, gentleman has a mixture of trees, shrubs, perennial plants, even a water feature, all growing in containers. And you will definitely still get butterflies and hummingbirds coming around to do their thing. Absolutely lovely. Patio spaces, native and native slash waterwise gardens like this become great spaces to spend time in. They smell great. There's birds and butterflies hanging out. Uh, a lot of times the patio spaces in these get way more, way more used than uh, the, the turf areas that they're replacing, which would theoretically you know, be plenty easy to, to set up a table and chair on. And one of the cool things about native gardens is, is that kind of more relaxed, natural look lends itself to both very uh, sustainable as well as less expensive options for patio spaces. So like I love this, uh, just pea gravel for the patio. And then that just sweeps into becoming the, the ground cover for these dry plants nearby. Beautiful, very functional. Uh, and, you know, you wouldn't want necessarily wall to wall open to the sky gravel in your whole landscape. But when you have this mixture of plants and trees and all of that, then the gravel for the walking open space, especially if there's some shade, uh, can be quite appropriate. This could also just all be, you know, wood chip mulch if that's what you want. And, and that's fine, too. And if you can get a hold of that for free, you know, that's great. Decomposed granite, which is that kind of beige-ish in most cases in Southern California, kind of compacted walking surface that you find at a lot of parks and things like that uh, is also a popular uh, way to go with patio spaces. And both of these, if you're thinking about the turf replacement rebates, uh, as long as it's permeable, which means if the rain falls, it doesn't uh, you know, wash off like uh, asphalt and concrete are not permeable. But pea gravel and decomposed granite are considered to be permeable. The rain can kind of soak through them and, and keep going down to the soil. Uh, those, those are acceptable if you want to do a small patio space or in your turf replacement rebate project. Uh, so yeah, very nice spaces. You see a lot of patio spaces actually going in in front yards and people who I work with on front yard landscapes come back and tell me, I've never thought I would spend so much time in my front yard, but now there's something to enjoy and to look at and people end up talking to more of their neighbors than they ever did. And normally they find that that's a good thing. Uh, here is a uh, pathways also important. And if you want your pathway can just be the gap in between your plants. However, a lot of people do like as a visual element and to make access uh, easier to actually put in pathways. So decomposed granite is an, is a, uh, common choice for pathways. Here it's lined with a river rock stone. I think this is just an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous front yard landscape, combination of native perennials, some shrubs, and some uh, native grass alternatives, native meadow sedge. Here it can be much kind of more built out and formal, and I really like this juxtaposition of the formal structure and then the kind of looser, you know, decomposed granite and a little bit of rock sort of edging. Absolutely gorgeous. Here's pea gravel used as a pathway, again, lined with local river rock. Broken concrete. If you are doing a project and you end up breaking up an old concrete patio or driveway, that can be reused as kind of stepping stones or flagstones, uh, either just as individual steps with larger pieces or kind of puzzled together as a path like this. Uh, the price is right. It keeps it out of the dump. Can be very heavy because they're very thick and it takes some uh, doing to get a hang of, of making them level, but can be a great way to reuse material. Or it can even be, you know, something like these large uh, stepping stones. These look like they're big enough that they were probably concrete that was poured in place, but you can get pretty large ones from the local building supply stores as well. And I really like this this kind of rigid grid line, because that kind of balances the very wild aspect of the landscape. Again, that kind of cues to care. This is very stylized. Uh, and so that all kind of tension works together. Uh, here you have flagstone, where it transitions from decomposed granite to flagstone that is still remains permeable because there is decomposed granite instead of like mortar filling in in between the flagstone. Or, or just concrete pavers. 
with the wood chip mulch in between. Totally viable way to do it. This is similar, uh, this is not my backyard, but similar to most of the pathways in my backyard where they're just wood chip mulch. And I have some areas with rock, some areas with broken concrete, some areas with branches as the edging for that. Uh, the price is right. And because my backyard slopes some, uh, gravel could get slippery, decomposed granite uh, isn't great on slopes because when it rains, it can erode and, and run off. And so the wood chip works very well informally. And then other elements thinking about capturing rainwater. This goes back to landform, but here's some more pictures related to that. And again, there's the whole rainwater harvesting for home landscapes workshop. So we're not going to spend too much time on it, but thinking about whether it's a downspout or if you replace your downspout with a rain chain, are there going to be some plants that when it does rain, will really appreciate that extra water here. Here, hummingbird sage is one that will appreciate that extra water. And then working with, in most cases, especially for a native garden, whatever your local stone type is. So in most of Southern California, uh, that's going to be a kind of river rock style with all these colors of gray. Uh, looks really nice. Also, in most cases, your local rock is going to be far, far cheaper than the other options at the materials yard, or you might have plenty in your backyard already or know people who want to get rid of it. In some of the more coastal areas or like up in kind of Santa Barbara, uh, hills there, you get into kind of more browns. But normally working with whatever local is, is not only going to look the best, but it's also where you're going to be able to find the most different sizes, which helps form a natural look. So a lot of the quote ornamental stones and, and gravels, there's only you know like one size available, like one inch or three quarters of an inch. And if you do a whole feature in your landscape, uh, that ends up looking kind of funny. But when you work with the local material of different sizes, then you can vary it. You can have, for example, on this dry stream bed, here's the kind of steeper walled part, even though it's not that high, that holds the soil back and then the gravels underneath. And then if you mix some cobblestone or boulders elsewhere in the landscape, again, you can get that kind of matching tone material. So it all holds together. Some different examples. Or even pathways, again, working with pavers, and then here's a very tiny gravel in between so that the water could soak in instead of a poured concrete block where that water washes away somewhere else. And it can be a work of art if you want, or it doesn't need to be. And you can just put down some rocks and have it be very functional. And then also challenge yourself to get creative with other elements. So here is the cat run in the Gottlieb Native Garden, which is a very famous uh, California native garden in Beverly Hills on a large property. And, you know, with all of this, you're going to have so much life coming to your landscape that uh, if you have a cat, I encourage you to keep that cat indoors. Uh, I love cats. We, my partner and I have four rescue cats, but they stay indoors enjoying all the life from inside because it's not their fault. They are just instinctively uh, hunt and hunt and hunt. And so here's one example of letting those cats go outside, but in a responsible way. Uh, catios on a smaller level are, are one way that people can do it as well. So when we get to all of that, kind of the idea now becomes apparent that planting design, you know, choosing the plants is just one part of design. And the reason why we do the planting design part uh, kind of later, although we've talked about the ideas of color and contrast and all of that is because when you think through things, knowing that you want a patio in a location and then you're going to be a pathway to connect it and maybe you're going to be setting up a space for your grill over there. In some ways, that's easier to think about first because that starts to take a really large space and then kind of break it down into smaller spots as you think about, for example, the social functions that you might be doing or I'm going to need to be able to drag my trash cans through here and all of that. And then once you have those smaller spots that are already kind of conceptually broken up, becomes a little bit easier to envision. Okay, here's going to be my one spot for a tree. I'm going to have some shrubs over there, a line of taller shrubs at the edge of the property, and that's going to leave room for some smaller shrubs and some, some perennial plants near the path. Uh, it starts to become a little bit easier to envision, and we'll, we'll kind of walk through all of that together when we do our example. We're going to take our break 
so everyone can breathe, kind of let some of that information soak in. Again, don't be intimidated if you didn't absorb all of it, no problem. I'll say that if you absorb 25% of what we're talking about today, then you will probably be in a better space for looking at your home landscape design than uh, most people are when they hit the nursery and start buying plants. Undoubtedly, you will be in a much better place. And so what we're going to do is it's just about 1050 now. We'll take a five minute break, use the restroom, grab something to drink, and then we will come back together with the nitty gritty of selecting a plant for a specific spot. The, all, everything that goes into choosing the right plant for the right place. So we will be back here at 1055 sharp. All right, everybody, we are back and we are going to get started again. Mm -hmm. Finally, with plant selection. It's all about putting the right plant in the right place. I don't believe there is any such thing as having a green thumb. When people come to me and tell me they're just bad at growing plants and they can't keep a plant alive, I always ask them a question. And the question is, when you buy a new plant, do you research, which is easier to do these days by going online, even just using Google, if you don't have a, do your research when you buy that plant, what it needs, sun and shade, the amount of water it needs, how to care for it. And every time I have asked someone that question, it says they're bad at growing plants. Universally, they say, Nope, I just stick it in the ground and hope for the best. People who are good at growing plants either do the research, ask someone they know who knows a lot about it, or have accumulated enough knowledge by doing that over and over again that they have a pretty good sense of what it's going to take already. It is all about doing the research and making sure that you are putting the right plant in the right place to set yourself up for success. Even if you're an amazing gardener, if you put the wrong plant in the wrong place, it's going to be an uphill battle and that plant's not going to be happy. So for putting plants together, here are the most important things. You want to learn and respect what the plant needs and then group those plants together with similar needs for water, sunlight, other factors. Look up the mature size of each plant and respect the space it needs. If you see that you're buying a shrub, and it's gonna be seven feet wide. Assume, especially if you're gardening in an inland climate where that heat kind of tends to make things get a little bit bigger. Assume it's going to get to the larger end of that spectrum. And with many of our native shrubs, unless when you're doing the research, you see that it grows slowly, I mean, it's gonna happen in a couple of years, maybe even just one year. And so if you put a seven foot wide shrub and it's you know one foot off the side of a path, and three feet away from another shrub, and I see this all the time, what's going to happen is after six months after you plant it, things are going to start to fill and it's going to look great. But by year three, you're going to have a tangled mess and it's going to be impossible to maintain and it will have grown all the way over your path. And then you have to start hacking things back really hard and it's never going to look right. And so respect the space that the plant needs. That doesn't mean you need to isolate it. So if you have a seven foot wide shrub, it doesn't need to have an, another three feet of open space all around it. And in fact, what I generally like to do is you plan for the, the plants to be kind of towards the, the larger sides of what you'll, you'll research and plan for them to kind of just touch unless you need extra space in between. And inevitably, they'll grow a little bit more usually and then get a little bit more mingled, but in a way that's manageable. And then if there's a little too much space in between them, you can toss out a few native wildflower seeds, some, some poppies or clarkias or something, especially when they're young, and, and kind of have that fill in or have some rocks or branches or something like that. Layering is good. So remember, if you're going to have a, a tall tree, you can have some smaller shade tolerant shrubs or smaller plants underneath. And remember that gardening is a process. So you're going to observe and learn from what works and learn from what doesn't work and then go from there. So here are the major factors in assembling a successful planting in terms of right plant, right place. Sun or shade. Now, as I mentioned before, and we'll get into it now, full sun doesn't mean sun up to sundown. Six or more hours of direct sunlight throughout most of the year qualifies as full sun. And so in Southern California, 
you know, if, for example, the, the plants up against the east or the west side of a house will be in the shade either in the morning or the evening, but unless there's something else blocking them, though, that could still be a, a very successful place for growing full sun plants. Uh, the north side of the house is a little bit trickier, and, and we can talk about that a little bit more because part of the year it's kind of in more shadow, uh, and we'll look at that in the design example. And part shade is another common thing that you will see. Part shade can mean a couple of hours of direct sunlight in the morning and then kind of shaded the rest of the day. Or it can mean kind of like a tall dappled shade from an overhead tree, but that's not super dense, or maybe out towards the edge of a tree canopy. If you see something that just requires shade, just shade, that, especially in inland Southern California, means pretty much no direct sunlight because even a couple of hours of direct sun on a hot afternoon could kind of burn the foliage of plants that need true, true shade. Next factor is soil drainage. Now, this can kind of sound complicated, but I will make it uh, quite easy for you, hopefully. Most native plants or many native plants, we could say, want what's called well-drained soil. That means that if it's been raining and the soil gets saturated, it's not going to be super long until that soil starts to drain to lower profiles in the in the until the water starts to drain out to lower profiles in the soil, which allows a little bit more oxygen to start to come back into the, the root zone. And if you have well-drained soil, you can pretty much in terms of soil grow most native plants. However, some people have heavy clay soil. In our local area, for example, like Chino Hills, notorious for heavy clay soil. The thing with heavy clay soil is that it doesn't drain quickly once it's saturated. And the soil can kind of sit there and remain soggy for days and days after a, a series of rain events. And some native plants really, really do not like that and will not grow well in that condition. But there are plenty of native plants that will. And then if you have compact soil, for example, if you're putting in a native garden in a front yard where someone used to park a truck in that space uh, that was just dirt for a long time, you might have compact soil that's not clay, but it might still drain slowly. And so in terms of choosing your plants, uh, it, it almost is like at least until an ecosystem is restored and roots are growing and loosening up that soil at the beginning, uh, in terms of drainage, it's almost like you have clay. And so how do you tell if you're not sure? Well, you can do a very quick drainage test. If you're doing a whole garden, dig some holes in a number of areas. Roughly dig a hole, roughly uh, one foot hole, roughly one foot by one foot. Doesn't need to be perfect. Fill that hole with water a couple of times. And don't worry about timing it at the beginning. Eventually you will. But the first thing you want to do is make sure the soil all around that hole underneath the sides is saturated because you test drainage once the soil is already saturated with water, see what drains out. If that's you start and that soil is dry, that's going to change the conditions that that water might leave that hole faster just because the soil around it is dry. So dig a one foot hole, fill it with water a couple of times, come back later. Uh, that might need to be the next day. And if it takes a long time to settle in, that might not say anything about the drainage yet. Sometimes our well-drained soils, when they're very, very dry, they actually repel the water for a while. So just soak it a couple of times. Don't worry about it yet. Then come back and the third time, fill it with water and start timing how quickly it goes down. And you want to get a sense of over the time that it drops through that whole hole, roughly how many inches per hour is it draining? If roughly your soil drains two inches per hour or more, congratulations, you have well-drained soil. You don't need to worry about it. If it's between one and two inches per hour, that's kind of medium draining soil. It's not the best. It's not the worst. In most cases, you could probably get away with planting plants that need well-drained soil. 
on some sites, I have had that kind of in-between drainage and the plants that need well-drained soil are always just fine. I've had other sites where then we get like a whole series of storms one winter and some of the plants kind of suffer a little bit. If you have plants that when you do your research, you know, really, really need well-drained soil, you can kind of put them up on a mound or something like that of, of some additional soil to make sure they have good drainage. If your drainage is less than one inch per hour, you have poorly drained soil and that's okay. There are plenty of plants that are adapted to clay or not great draining soil. And you'll just work with plants on those lists, which I will show you some resources for that. And that's fine. That might actually make choosing plants a little bit easier because there's so many great plants to choose from. If you know that that needs to be one of your filters, then there's just slightly fewer plants to choose from. Still plenty of good choices. Uh, you never want to take clay soil and start mixing in sand to try to loosen it up. You would need to mix in so much sand to make a difference. Most people are never gonna do that. And then most of the time directly below, however deep you dig that in, it's still gonna be clay soil again. Uh, in most cases, what happens is people just mix in you know, barely enough sand to, to create something that's a little bit more like cement. It can actually kind of backfire. Uh, you can always add a little bit of compost. That doesn't, the compost uh, often doesn't hurt with poorly drained soil. Uh, but in most cases, what I do is just plant the plants that want uh, clay soil or have to do with clay soil. And then you might use, uh, you might choose to use wood chip mulch as a, a soil covering for the first couple of years. And as that organic matter naturally breaks down, sometimes that loosens up the clay soil a little bit as well. Just don't do too much right at the base of the plant, because again, we want the base of the plant to be able to, to dry out a little bit. So hopefully that helps. If you want to see a real kind of step-by-step -step picture of a soil drainage test that goes over that in more detail, check out our YouTube page and look at the recording for, uh, for it's something about, uh, forgetting the exact name of the title, it's something about uh, choosing, purchasing, and planting California native and water-wise plants. I believe that's it. And I think it's about 12 minutes in, uh, we'll show you pictures of a step-by-step -step soil drainage test and how to interpret those results. Next, irrigation frequency. That goes back to our hydro zoning. So most of our native and water-wise plants, like I mentioned, you're going to be water about once a month, once every three weeks in the months it doesn't rain uh, to keep them kind of how most gardeners want to keep them without watering them too much most of the year. But if you have plants that are going to be like your fruit trees watering once a week, if you're going to group native plants with those, uh, have them be plants that when you uh, are researching them can take some more water and then you'll be okay. Uh, growth habit is something that you might take into account. So uh, the shape, is it gonna be like tall and arching? Is it gonna be low and wide? Thinking about that, thinking about how that might interact with other plants nearby. And then this is one that you may or may not need to care about, but I'm, I'm listing it. If, if it's one too many things, don't worry about it. But growth rate, sometimes you can find the information of growth rate. and the reason why growth rate is useful to look at if it's readily available is because a lot of plants go very quickly, but some plants you see will grow slower, like manzanita uh, bushes. Uh, they are beautiful plants, but they tend to be a little bit slower to get going. And so if you know that going into it, just be sure that you really give that plant a little bit of extra space so it's not planted too close to some really fast growing shrubs that are maybe going to overwhelm it. And those are the factors. Uh, but once you know your drainage, it's well draining or, or slowly draining, then it becomes kind of easy. Sunshade, the amount of space it needs, irrigation frequency, those are the big things. And so now we're gonna do a couple of demos for those resources that I mentioned, top resources for choosing plants. First one is the Inland Valley Garden Planner website. And that is Something that we created, the Waterwise Community Center, Chino Basin Water Conservation District created to be as much as possible, and we're still trying to uh, improve quite a bit, uh, make something that's accessible and unintimidating to the average person who's starting to get interested in uh, doing this sort of stuff. And so this is the landing page. It's inlandvalleygardenplanner.org. And when you land here, there's some basic information uh, but really there's, I encourage you to, to check it out, but there's really two main sections. There's plants and there's design. And so if you go to 
the the plant area through either of these links, you you go to the plant finder. And this is really where you can get into those right plant, right place criteria. This was developed for uh, inland Southern California. However, vast majority of these plants can grow on the coast and the vast majority of these plants are, are gonna be just fine right up to the Bay Area. If you're in the true, true desert, make sure you know some of these plants will be great. Some of these plants uh, might not be as good. So check you know with local information as well. The information about the plants, if you know you can grow them, is going to be accurate for the most part. And then if you're at higher elevations up in the mountains, again, not all of these are going to be that frost sensitive. Uh, the irrigation recommendations were developed for inland Southern California. But if you're living kind of more uh, in the intermediate zone or towards the coast, then you can just get away with watering on the low end of, of what's here in these recommendations and you'll be good. And so kind of starting with the search, since we're talking about native plants, might as well click California native off the bat. So you can see we have 114 kind of California native plant profiles. There are way more good garden plants than that, but because we developed this resource for kind of the average gardener just getting into it. We only have plants that are relatively easy to grow, uh, relatively available from the nurseries and are some of our top choices. We're also after this gonna look at Calscape, which is for people who wanna go uh, deeper or just another great resource, uh, whether you're going deeper or at the beginning. And that is really the most extensive database that goes way into all sorts of California native plants. But here, these are kind of our top recommendations, especially for people just getting started. And from there, you can select more. So if you want a California native, for example, a shrub, you're looking for an area you know you need a shrub. Uh, most of the native plants are low water. Say low water. Uh, evergreen or deciduous. Most shrubs are evergreen. I'm just going to skip that. But you can say, hey, I have full sun for this area. And that's going to 52 plants because there's a lot of shrubs. And you can start looking through if you want, but you can even go one step further to say, well, maybe you do have clay soil. You don't have that good drainage. So now we're down to 31. But if you have clay soil, that's still 31 shrubs to choose from. Not so bad. And then maybe you also are wanting to make sure that it's going to be something that's great for birds. That's 30 because a lot of the native plants are great for birds. But from 30, that's still out of the hundreds of plants that you could maybe have to research without a resource like this. But you can start going from there, looking at pictures, and then anything that you might be interested in, uh, you can click on and get, here's the basic right plant, right place factors, if you are looking for that. But when you click on all of these plants, there's profiles with pictures close up, far away, some of them different seasons, a description. Here's uh, with even more information, kind of those right plant, right place properties water needs. Uh, this can kind of take a little bit of time to absorb, but we also have some additional links to explain this. And we're actually going to be working on a project within the next year to keep most this most important information, but to make it a little bit less intimidating, because we have heard from people that these charts are a little bit intimidating. So we're going to be working on that, but you know, essentially spend some time with it and uh, and you'll be able to understand it or check out our other online workshops where we talk more about irrigation for native plants. And then for all of these, you're going to need to know how to take care of them. And, you know, it, it is that work smarter, not harder. Uh, most of these plants will only want some amount of maintenance once or twice a year. But it's important to know, for example, some of the native plants, you're going to do your cleanup in the spring. Some of them, you're going to do your cleanup in the fall. And if you do your cleanup in the spring for plants that want to be cleaned up in the fall, oftentimes you might have just cut off all of the buds for everything that's about to go into flower. So it's important to do it at the right time of year. And you want to make sure you do it the right amount. Some plants just take a little bit of a trim. Some plants want a deeper cut back to really encourage next year's new growth. And so we break all of that down for you. And so that is kind of the basic of the plant finder. Uh, and then still putting that all together is a bit much for some people who are just kind of getting going and want some good basics to start with. And so we created this garden design section. And so here, uh, after working with people for many years, we realized that the average person who is starting to think about this for their yard 
there's not a million different things that people are interested in. And they kind of group together around different concepts. Some of these are purely native plant lists. Some of these are, for example, our Mediterranean garden uh, does not feature native plants. Most of them have at least some. Our colorful desert garden has a lot of desert native plants, but not 100%. But our bird and butterfly songbird garden, or, or sorry, our butterfly and songbird garden, our California native color garden, our meadow garden, our pollinator garden and our woodland garden, our California native plant lists, and then some of our desert ones are combinations of uh, native and uh, also just desert plants from other areas. And so each of these, if you're interested in any of these concepts, for example, the butterfly and songbird garden is a popular one. You can explore the design. And you get a description. You get a plant list. Now, this is not the end all and be all of butterfly and songbird garden plants, but to help the person who's kind of just getting started, we had a lot of requests from people. They just want uh, a few options for trees, a few options for shrubs. Some of these are full sun. Some of these can take part shade. A few options for the top easiest to grow smaller perennial plants. And here we have one grass. And so it's a relatively limited plant palette of all common, easy to find at nurseries that carry native plants, plants that are quite easy to grow. Uh, and then from there, maybe uh, most people still wouldn't use all of these plants in a landscape, but you might use most of them. And then you might do your research and add in you know, a few other things as well. And so for those lists, we have created designs for Basically, we created a process to create the, the kind of average for our area of the suburbs, extra large, large, medium, and small landscapes that use these plant lists. And you can get different views. The extra large ones have these patio spaces as well, which are not present in the smaller ones. And so you might take a look at all the different sizes because there might be concepts. And then within these views, there's, there's different uh, kind of viewfinders. So just the plants themselves, uh, labels, and then there's a pop-up version where you can click and automatically open the link to each of those plant profiles. And then if you like the look of any of them, these also match up exactly to these bird's eye view plant sets where you can see, for example, here, you know, it looks very, very dense from the angle. And there is a good amount of density because it is to support the wildlife. Uh, but you can see here, when you see the planting plan, there's some areas with a little bit more space in between. And this is also a guide to those plant combinations and the spacing. And you can literally download these and print them out on 11 by 17 sheet of paper and use a ruler because one eighth of an inch is like one foot in the real world if you want to kind of emulate any of these plant combinations. And then again, we have that for the extra large, large, medium, and small yards. So you can kind of see different approaches for all of that. And then if you're interested in any one of these specifically, and they also have the moisture needs, so all of these plants are compatible, this is kind of how we would recommend it. And then for all of these, you can go down here and you can download a PDF packet. And what that would give you is a single file that has all of these drawings. And because it's the PDF, you can also decide to print whatever sheets you want. And at the end, there's also a bunch more information about like how to build dry stream beds and working with wildflowers and other things like that to help you with your garden design project. In addition to that, we have some helpful lists. So for example, our favorite plants for the Inland Empire, Here's if you just want to see a list of all the California native plants we have. And then there's specific ones like slopes. What are the plants for hedges and screens? And now not all of these on these lists are native plants. And so you can you know, also check for natives, bird and wildlife. And then if you are going to have, for example, like a dry stream bed, most plants won't be happy right down in that dry stream bed, but there's a few that are. You can find out about it there. And then lastly, there's also a resources page where you can get some of our top workshop recordings, link to our YouTube playlist, uh, see our upcoming schedule to register that goes back to our Eventbrite page. And here's some additional details. So for example, uh, different mulch options, uh, information about planting techniques, for example, other things to help you along your way. 
And then where do you buy these plants? Pretty important. So our favorite uh, places that we know of, and if you know of other places, let us know. We'd love to have more on the list. But our favorite places to get different kinds of water-wise plants in this local area. And so you can also for soils, mulches, rocks, things like that, irrigation and landscape materials, et cetera. And also you can get the directions to our demonstration garden. If you want to, you can also create a login. And I'm not gonna take the time to go through that now, but basically you can uh, create a login and then that will allow you to create and save different lists of different ideas, you know, front yard, backyard, grandma's house, all that sort of stuff. So that's the Inland Valley Garden Planner. Thinking about native plants, another incredible resource, and I use this uh, quite often as well, is CalScape, which is a project of the California Native Plant Society. And so there's a few things here you can do, but one of the most powerful ones is that if you're interested, for example, in native plants that would be kind of relatively local to your area, which oftentimes it's not the only native plants that you could be successful with. Like I mentioned, you know, I like at my house in Pomona to bring in some of the desert plants, but it's also really interesting to kind of start with a basis of plants that might be local to your area, especially if you're thinking about that plant community approach. And so you can put in your zip code. And from there, you get a lot back, 639 plants that historically would likely have been local to your area. However, some of these are annuals. Some of them are obscure things that you will never find in a nursery. And some of them are great plants. So you might go from there to, some of them are difficult to grow. Some of them are very easy. So you might go from 639 to you know, very easy. And then you get kind of plants that are going to be a little bit more accessible. Again, some of these are gonna be great. Some of these uh, you might not be able to find. And then another thing that you can do, and then each of these, sorry, jumping ahead, each of these has then extensive information. One of the cool things is that we'll tell you specifically what wildlife it supports, including down to the species of butterflies and moths. You get, this is overwhelming to some people, but I think it's super cool. Uh, you get kind of historic projections of what the native range of this plant was. I spent a lot of time looking at those. And then again, right plant, right place factors. Uh, and you can also do an advanced search, which actually can kind of help. So you can do the type, the right plant, right place factors, drainage, they have lots of different factors, uh, ease of care. And then also because they have so many different plants, you can also, for example, for the average uh, home gardener, you'd wanna put probably commonly available at local nurseries if you are putting together your design. Another cool thing about CalScape is that if you're going to like a botanical garden plant sale or a specialty nursery like Theodore Payne Foundation and you find something that is kind of rare and cool, there's probably going to be an entry for it on CalScape. And that will often be your best source of information. So those are our two favorite choices uh, for where to get your information. And then another thing you can do sometimes is just type that plant name into Google and see what comes up. And sometimes you get other interesting resources with different information. And so another note, as you're doing that, native gardening is a little bit different. And I think in this case, it's a cooler and more interesting way that helps you tune into our seasons in California and understand that as part of the design. And so I say that with this picture, this is California buckwheat. And you can see here, part of the beauty of that plant is the flowers kind of fade to this dry rust color. And that's part of the look. I am here, I believe in this garden, looking in the background. I can't remember the exact date, but I believe it's in the fall looking at the condition of things. And you can see in the background, things are a little bit drier. There's some kind of golds and browns and that's part of the beauty. Uh, California native gardening is not about lush, lush, lush all throughout the year. The summer is a quieter time. Some plants, I'll show you some pictures a little bit later on, go a little bit dormant, embrace that. Find the beauty in those browns and golds. And then if you're someone who really wants to make sure you don't have too much of that, when you research, find some beautiful evergreen shrubs. There are plenty that are very low water, but that don't kind of go dormant perceptively at all if you give it those, you know, every once a month, three weeks kind of 
irrigation. And so you can kind of balance that out to kind of have it look however you want. Or if you don't want that to happen at all, you can still work with native plants and focus on those plants that really just stay solidly evergreen year round. It's all up to you. Uh, we are not going to, there's some supplemental lists at the end going to talk about this plant, this plant, this plant, this plant, because this is more about design and empowering you to do your own research. That being said, I teach another class called Favorite Plants for Southern California uh, Gardens or something like that. And that is the, the one where I do go through plant by plant by plant, not exclusively, but probably over 90% native plants talking about it. So what are those plants that don't go dormant at all and look green year round? I talked about it there. I'm going to be teaching that coming up in the fall, but you can also find that recording again on our YouTube page if you don't want to wait till then. I also coming up, I'm going to be teaching, and it's already on our YouTube page, a class about habitat gardening called Gardening for Birds, Butterflies, Pollinators, and more. And from that perspective, uh, not necessarily the aesthetics, I also go through kind of plant by plant of all the cool stuff. Uh, so tune into our seasons and learn how to kind of find the beauty in the summer when things calm down and kind of flesh those browns and golds. Native plants are mostly easy to grow, but they require a little bit of learning and a different approach. And again, we have workshops about the, the kind of uh, maintenance aspect of it as well. But your first thing to do is put the right plant in the right place by doing your research, first step for success. And so some questions. Uh, does it matter what season you plant your natives? Some are a good idea to do so. Great question. Uh, at this point, I highly encourage you, wait until the fall. No plants, even water-wise plants, really want to be planted right in the middle of summer. Now, professional contractors who need to be doing projects year-round will sometimes do that. They also have learned precisely how things need to be watered to be successful. And some of them, you know, to kind of balance things out, will make the homeowner a guarantee. They'll come back in the fall and replace anything that died over the summer. If you are doing the work yourself, set yourself up for success, especially if it's first time. Don't plant in the middle of summer. Thanksgiving through New Year's is like the sweet spot to plant. There's still a little bit of warmth. Uh, some plants are going to start growing right away. Some plants are going to look a little bit calm on top. You might not see that much growth, but they're rooting in underneath. They're getting settled in. And then even a lot of the ones that don't grow that much when spring hits the next season, they're going to be rooted and ready to go. Problem is if you plant now, it's the, the transition from that little, even if it's a water-wise plant, from that little nursery root ball in the potting soil to having to live out in the garden can be pretty, pretty harsh in the summer. And you're going to be more likely to lose plants. So ideally, uh, plant in the fall through early winter. Sometimes I end up planting in the spring, just schedules, but I really, really try to be done by the end of March, early April at the latest, really focusing on uh, fall through winter if I can make that happen for my project schedule. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, plenty more to cover. And so let's jump into our design process example. And you want to start with the base plan. If you've come to my other classes, I've been saying this for far too long uh, and I just had some staffing issues and some delays, but I am so close to finishing a whole series of videos that will be going up onto the Inland Valley Garden Planner, which are going to go over some of the content from this workshop, but really also spend a lot more time on the design process, basically teaching how to do design using the Inland Valley Garden Planner. So we're going to be looking at a number of slides that are excerpts from those videos. And if you're going to want to be able to check out those videos when they are finally released, which will hopefully be in the next couple of months, sign up for our newsletter. But you want to start with a base plan. And normally what I do for the base plan is I will either on Google Maps or to get a little bit better access, you can download for free a program called Google Earth Pro. Zoom in to your property and take a screenshot. So this is the property where I live in Pomona uh, when the front yard still have had a lawn. And we'll be using the front yard as the detailed case study. And there's a couple of things you can do from here. If you are up for it, I encourage you to go as far as taking measurements, drawing out your plan on graph paper, because then you can really refine exactly your plants, how many they are, how big they're going to be. That's awesome. Some people are just not those types of people. They're not going to do it. If you're going to be kind of eyeballing it and going from there, at least get your concepts down on paper. And so you can just print this out. 
uh, and work with some tracing paper on top of it and just eyeball the sides of things. But if you are up for it, I would go out, take your measurements. Uh, oftentimes you can't really see exactly what's going on at the base of the house. And so I kind of drew those in, kind of using that to take my measurements and then drawing that out on graph paper. Uh, depending on the size of your property, you might be choosing kinds of different size graph paper for that. In most cases for a suburban property, you're going to be better off working on 11 by 17, 11 inch by 17 inch graph paper rather than the typical stuff you get at the uh, like office supply store, which is normal paper size. Uh, easy to get from either an art supply store or order online, 11 inch by 17 inch graph paper. And then depending on the size of your area, uh, either one typical square, which is one fourth of an inch will equal one foot. That's barely what I was able to do in my front yard, which is about 1,200 square feet of landscape area, or more typical for, for a uh, suburban yard that's bigger is one square might be one eighth of an inch. So, so one, uh, one square, or sorry, one square might be two feet by two feet, uh, one eighth of an inch. So hopefully that makes sense. And then you can work with your ruler as well but the squares kind of help with your layout. And it doesn't need to be perfect, perfect, perfect. The most important thing is this is going to be a tool to help you get the right number of the right plants onto the site. And then you're going to lay it out and adjust things anyway. So, you know, if you need to kind of fudge some of the angles and stuff like that to get something close enough, that's just fine. Don't drive yourself crazy about it. Uh, and then from there, you can do a couple of things. If you're not going to do the whole graph paper thing, you can just kind of sketch it out roughly, especially just to get your ideas down. And what you want to start with is your goals. So even before, you know, this plant, this plant, this plant, think about your goals. So for my partner, Kira and I, our goals for our front yard were, we wanted a beautiful front yard. We wanted to have lots of habitat for birds, butterflies, and pollinators. We wanted it to be low water. We wanted to get a little bit more of a sense of privacy. We're on a cul-de-sac and the front yards, you know, they're not tiny, tiny. This is 1,200 square feet of landscape area. But honestly, with the way the houses are situated, it feels smaller than that. And because everyone just had lawns, uh, like it, it feels like inside the house from the rooms that face forward that there's like four other houses looking directly into yours. And with everyone having lawns, all the windows face each other. So we wanted a sense of a little bit more privacy, kind of obscuring the views a little bit more without like just building a fence all the way around it and, and totally turning our back to the neighborhood. Uh, we wanted it to smell great. There's so many great smelling California native plants. We haven't even talked about that part yet. Uh, and especially if you have them in your yard and you have the screen or the windows open on a hot day, that can just kind of almost come into the house. It's very lovely. Or when it rains as well. Uh, and then because we face north and we happen to be in a neighborhood without a lot of street trees, it's very hot, but we do get a good view of the San Gabriel Mountains and it's gorgeous, especially in the rare event these days when it snows. And so we want to provide some shade and some kind of sense of, of shelter and privacy. But in certain views, we really wanted to leave open that mountain view from anything being too, too tall. And so those were our main goals. Write them down, have them with you all the time. Put it on a notepad, don't leave it because it's easy to have specific goals going in. But then if you get stuck thinking about this plant and this much room for those plants, you can kind of forget about them. So hold on to your list of goals. You know, photocopy it, print it out, put it on post-its, just keep it, keep it around all the time so you always go back to your list of goals. Then you go into a process where you, you think about your site, you evaluate your site and think about first plants and features you want to keep. Uh, if you have, for example, a well-established magnolia tree that's beautiful, well, that's not a native plant and that might not be a low water plant, but that might be worth keeping. There's value in that. And your garden doesn't have to be all or nothing with California natives. Remember, just match the higher water demanding existing plants with plants that like the same conditions. So for example, for that magnolia tree, uh, that, that would be too much water than a lot of native plants like, but some of them like yarrow and a lot of the native grasses and even some of the riparian plants that don't need constant water all the time will be fine with that medium water use. And that might be a cool way to be able to use some of those where you might not have thought about it otherwise. 
and you do your right plant, right place research. And then you go into a phase called site assessment, which is just a fancy way of saying, take that base plan that you have, whether it's your measurements on graph paper or whether it's on tracing paper over just a printout of the aerial photo from Google Earth or just a rough sketch like I showed, and just note down on paper your most important observations. Most of those are things that deal with either your design goals or things that have to do with the right plant, right place concept. And again, putting them down on paper is just a powerful way so that you can refer back to it and make sure you don't forget about things that maybe when you're standing out there are obvious to you, but then when you're thinking about plants and design and stuff like that, you might forget. So you get a good site assessment down on paper, it's easier to remember all of that. So observe for as long as it takes. Ideally, you'll have watched the space for more than a full year through some rain events to know if you have any flooding issues. Uh, just kind of see what's going on. Sometimes that doesn't work with your timeline. Do the best you can. Uh, so sun and shady areas, Soil and drainage, what we talked about, if normally that's going to be kind of similar over your whole landscape area, but that might not be the case. So if there's an area with particularly bad drainage, because that was the one space where someone was parked in their truck for a decade before you bought the house, then, then you might need to note that as that's the slowly draining area. Uh, views. That includes views that you might want to keep, like your view of the mountains. That also might include views that you want to block, like your neighbor's second story addition that stares down into your hot tub. That's a good spot for a tall, narrow tree like a Catalina Island cherry. Where water flows when it rains, uh, whether it's coming off the roof, whether it's flowing down from a driveway, are there areas that flood where you need to do something with your landform that's going to improve that? Uh, or where water flows, you know, like where are the downspouts from the roof gutters on your house if your house has roof gutters? If you are putting in a dry stream bed, that's going to be the natural place to start them to capture some of that water. Any of those microclimates, super hot and cold areas, it's a good thing to note. So for example, even if it's very intuitive, you have a long driveway that, that gets full blasting afternoon sun, that's a hot microclimate, you know, make a, a little bubble and, and note that out. And so as you're thinking about things, that, remember that that's the place for plants that can keep the, take the heat. You know, and then you do your best. You know, it's not always super intuitive to find all those plants that can take the heat, but you know, do your best. Not a place to try to put a part shade plant in full sun. It's the most important thing. Are there noise or other neighbor issues that you want to note down of specific views you need to block from specific neighbors? Uh, are you thinking about the sound of maybe a recirculating water feature? It could be great for the birds and for habitat, but also maybe helps kind of calm some of that noise from the neighborhood. And then we kind of mentioned plants you want to keep, but also seasonal weeds. If there's a really, really terrible uh, problem with weeds in one section of the garden, maybe you're going to spend an extra season in that section, kind of continuing to work on that, and you'll plant that later on. When you're doing both the goal setting and the site assessment, make sure you include all the important stakeholders in your planning. So here, uh, looking at the next phase of our young backyard garden and plans of having a meeting with two of my very important stakeholders. And your site assessment, you know, could be on graph paper to scale or might not be. So this is kind of more of a looser way of noting it down, you know, roughly here. And, and here's kind of all the things from my front yard that were most important. The mountain view, just remember, uh, intuitively uh, early on, I thought I want some shelter. I want some shade for the front yard. I like this concept of the woodland. I'm going to plant a big honking oak tree. But then after I spent a few weeks uh, actually living on that property, I, I realized how much I value those views out to the mountains and thought, well, that's actually going to be too big and too tall to just have over my whole yard. We can have an oak tree kind of towards the corner of the backyard. And here I'm going to be working with some smaller kind of large shrubs that could prune up into small trees, still trying to evoke the sense of a woodland, even though we don't have room for the tall classic woodland plants, because I got that mountain view kind of down on the paper and then started to think about it. Here's the area that feels too open, that I want to obscure some. Uh, this house faces north northeast-ish, but you know, significantly north. And so here, uh, the north side of a house or a building has a, a pretty significant seasonal shade thing going on, where because in the middle of winter, the sun is pretty low in the south part of the sky, even at noon, and then it slowly rises to where it's totally overhead in the summer, 
it's going to be immediately on the north side of a house or a garage. It's going to be pretty shady much of the year, but then come summer, it's going to be high overhead sun. So not every plant can take either that much shade or that much sun. And so on that zone, it's going to be a little bit more limited, but normally what works well is plants that can take either full sun or partial shade can survive that transition pretty well. We also had some serious kind of water accumulation issues up against the foundation and kind of flooding the, the walkway to the house, which we solved with a series of dry stream beds and other things. Again, if you want to see about how we solved that issue, check out the uh, Rainwater Harvesting for Home Gardens class. But as I'm starting to think about that issue for the design, then charting, there were not roof gutters on this house and it would have been a pain to put them on. So charting, you know, where exactly does the water come down and accumulate coming off of the roof? And that was the main uh, site assessment. I did notice when uh, I had to do some plumbing work before I moved into the house that at one point in time, the water main line was replaced and they didn't do a good job on the trench. It's only about six inches deep. So in most cases, that might not be that much of an issue because it should be installed deeper. But for me, this was an issue because I couldn't even put a one gallon plant on top of this water main let alone dig a dry stream bed. So I got, that was one specific thing to me and I got that figured out. Normally the, the water main line is a straight line between your water meter and where you'll see uh, some little bit of plumbing come up outside the house. And normally there's a hose bib there as well. Normally it's along there. So that's the, the site analysis. Always a really good idea. And if you're going to be doing anything related to like digging a dry stream bed or any serious digging uh, is legally your responsibility to call Dig Alert in Southern California, which is 811. You can also do it online through their website. And that's a free service that the utilities provide where someone will come out within 72 hours and they will mark any underground utilities in the project area. There's often not a whole lot in older neighborhoods, but in newer neighborhoods, for example, fiber optic lines are often buried and the fiber optic main lines will go through people's yards. So I definitely have heard stories of like the neighbor hired some people to plant a new hedge and they took out the fiber optic internet for the entire neighborhood because no one called dig alert first. And then you might be financially liable, figure it out ahead of time. doesn't hurt and it's free. So from there, you know, your site analysis it's important to get it down, but it's not rocket science. It's all about your observations. And from there, you go into thinking about, again, about your right plant, right place, match the plants to soil and size conditions. You do your online research. You also might visit local public gardens and nurseries with native plants. California Botanic Garden in Claremont, Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano has beautiful demonstration plantings. You visit us at the Waterwise Community Center in Montclair. And Theater Pain Foundation in Sun Valley, their nursery and surrounds has beautiful demonstration gardens as well. Uh, visit uh, at least some, if not all of those. Then you're going to be doing your research using those uh, different resources. You'll probably fall in love with a whole bunch of plants. Remember, keep it simple. Don't put in too many different plants and crowd them. For the average kind of medium to large size suburban front yard or backyard, I find 12 to 15 different plant species total is what's going to be, what's going to do it for the average person to where they'll find it kind of maintainable if they're first time doing it. They can learn the different plants that gives you, you know, one or two trees, plenty of shrubs, plenty of smaller plants. You could have a lovely garden with less. You can have a lovely garden with five plants and you could have 72 plants if you want. But for most people think, you know, 12 to 15 probably no more than 20 if you're if you're just starting out with this. And from there, you're going to start to kind of think about your, your concepts, kind of feeling things out. I encourage you to do this with tracing paper so you can come up with a bunch of different concepts. Your first one is usually not going to be the best one. So just go through them. Don't judge yourself. And then eventually you might have three, four, five different things. And your sixth one might combine things. You might be, you know, kind of getting to it. Don't be too critical of yourself. Just get ideas down. And so here is an example, and, and you don't need to necessarily even be thinking about plants at the beginning. And in fact, I encourage you not to get too obsessed with plants too quickly. So for here, now I'm thinking about my goals and I'm thinking about my site analysis where I had, you know, I want to have some more privacy here, but not too tall, et cetera. So we figured we wanted to kind of 
wrap this area. So when we're inside the house, we don't spend too much time in our front yard because we have a large backyard. Some people, their patio space is gonna be in their front yard, it might be a little different, or it might be similar. Uh, so we realized that most of our views are actually from either when we're leaving the house in the morning, or here's where we eat dinner and we kind of get a view out here. Uh, here's a desk that sometimes I work at. So it's looking out. And so one kind of classic design thing, which may or may not be appropriate to your space, but is an easy thing to do, is you create a sense of layering from your main view. So your taller plants in the back, then your medium plants, then your smaller plants up close. It's not the only way to do it. As long as the right plant is in the right place, the plants don't necessarily care that that's it, but it creates more of a sense of depth. And a, it's kind of a, a trick to kind of have a more visually, kind of subconsciously visually appealing space in a lot of situations, especially if you're like inside looking out. And so we realized we wanted a small tree here, a small tree here. This one, we really knew we wanted to be evergreen because of the way the angles come together. If it's not, we're just looking at driveways and asphalt. This one could be kind of maybe a deciduous multi-trunk tree that loses leaves in the winter. Here, this just looks out and, and the angle is a little bit harsher than even like it looks like here. Sitting here without any plants, it's just looking at a strip of gravel and cars parked in the neighbor's driveway. So here we wanted an informal hedge to really block that view and create a green backdrop from the different few angles. And then some room for some medium-sized shrubs in between. We knew we wanted a bird bath that could be seen from these two windows. And then some shade and sun tolerant plants around here. Room for a couple of hedges, not to really grow in front of a block, but to kind of frame the windows here. Uh, we had our water harvesting, first part of our water harvesting solution here. And then little pops of color at the corners so that even though we're creating a sense of uh, shelter on the inside, we didn't want to feel like we were really turning our back to the neighborhood. So little areas for perennial planting still where there'll be some nice colorful smaller plants, a little arrangement of rocks or something like that to look nice for the neighborhood. From there, still not worried about placing individual plants, but you can start to refine it a little bit. So then here you can see I'm just creating lists of Maybe here are some of the species of plants that would do well in this zone. How are some of the species that would do well on this western edge where we have that reflected heat. Now for the larger plants, the trees, the key shrubs, I'm getting kind of into ideas about specific plants. Uh, here you can see we went from original concept, maybe three shrubs to uh, have space for actually a little bit more the more time I spent looking at it. Because this on this approach, we weren't working with graph paper right from the beginning. Now, if you're more up for the measurements, kind of more, and there's more people who are like, quote, left brain people. Uh, this is me. I show this first because I don't want it to be intimidating. But, you know, the way I would actually do it, I'd start here, take my measurements, do my exact graph paper on that graph paper, on that base map. Once you have that, photocopy it a bunch of times. You never want to, if you put this time into it, have to redraw this base map because it takes a while. Uh, photocopy it, scan it, take pictures of it, all of those. And then I printed out a bunch more. And then on one of them, I did, this is the same, just with a little bit more detail uh, site analysis. And then you could start, the nice thing is once you do your site analysis to scale, once you start really feeling things out, you can do it with graph paper on top and then you just build layers. And then you could slide your site analysis out, put it back in. Uh, so figuring things out. And then it becomes... Once you have a concept that you like, you could rapidly start putting plants in actually at the scale. So you do your research and then you know, well, okay, I'm going to draw a circle. That's going to be the equivalent of a five foot uh, shrub, a four foot shrub, a, a two foot plant. And you can get this thing called a circle template, any art supply, easy to get online. And so if you're working at a scale, so here each square was one foot. Then you can take these different circles of different measured sizes, so so quarter of an inch is one foot, and then actually mark with the Sharpie for the scale I'm working at. So my, my half an inch plants are going to, or my two foot plants are gonna be half an inch. So the half an inch circle, I, I mark two feet, all the way up to my eight foot and 10 foot shrubs. And then, you know, when you get your ideas about plants, you can really just start putting them in. Again, the first one is not gonna necessarily be the best one, but I'm kind of following this general concept that I laid out earlier that wasn't to scale. And here is one that's following, I think the woodland, an example that's following the woodland 
might've been the songbird and butterfly plant template. And then you go from here. And it doesn't need to be a work of art. In fact, the first draft of it probably shouldn't be a work of art. It's a tool for you. It's not an art competition. Uh, and and if, if you like this and this gets you to your plan and your plan counts, that could be it. Doesn't need to be a work of art. If you want to, and sometimes it's easier, it just makes it easier to uh, look at as well. You can do another layer of tracing paper, kind of trace things out. And then this is just a cheap pack of colored pencils that I ordered online doesn't need to be the super expensive ones. And I'm just color coding these again, not to be a work of art surrounding them with marker, just makes it easier to kind of look at and see the groupings of different plants and the patterns. If you want to, you can you know, color in the, the ground uh, cover color and, and kind of go from there. So, you know, whether you leave it at here or you go all the way to the end, all scaled and with your exact plant counts, that's totally up to you. The advantage of doing it to scale, taking all those measurements and doing that is you can get those exact plant counts. But I also know people that like to work more intuitively and they'll kind of picture the space. They'll kind of get little, like one trick you can do if you don't want to draw out everything to scale is once you kind of have your basic plan and you know what plants you want in each area from just maybe freehand sketching, you can go to the landscape supply store and get a, an inexpensive pack of uh, what are often called irrigation flags. There's these little uh, little flags that come in a pack of 100 and you can actually write on them with a Sharpie. So you can write plant names on them and actually go out to your site and put them in the ground and measure in between them and kind of figure out your plant spacings, you know, more interactively doing that. Just, you know, whatever's going to work for you, don't let yourself be intimidated enough not to take the project on because of that. But if this works, this is kind of the a great organizing way to do it. And so this is very similar, but a little bit different to the design I actually did for my front yard. This is the design I did for my front yard, responding to those same things, but just in a little bit of a different way. Uh, I like a very dense planting. And because we don't walk out here a lot, we did instead of an open path, a ground cover of uh, native yarrow, which grows in and fills up all the spaces and is a great uh, pollinator and butterfly plant. And so to kind of wrap things up as we get towards the end of the workshop. I'll kind of just walk you through how that design became reality. So here's the house when we moved in. Typical patchy Bermuda grass, suburban lawn. Here's it uh, when we kind of started on the project. We were going to be using uh, sheet mulching as our main way to kill the lawn after neglecting it for a very, very long time. Uh, knew that there's going to be some regrowth. When you check out our, and this is not totally ideal, uh, we kind of did take some shortcuts and we knew that we we're going to have to do more weeding because of that. However, uh, you know, project schedules are project schedules. So this was getting towards the very end of what I mentioned was the, the proper uh, planting period. And I was not going to being who I am going to water a lawn for a whole other year. Uh, as I killed my turf kind of in the, the more proper way, but also uh, I was not going to move into a neighborhood and just leave it like this. So we did what we did, uh, but definitely check out our moving your turf the right way class for how to do it perfectly right. But this worked out well enough for us. So, you know, you do what you do. So from the, the as dead as a lawn can get through neglect, we laid out our plants pretty close to the plan, but you always kind of shift things once you notice things when you're putting them on the ground. The plan is a tool to, to, to kind of get you to a nice planting. It's not the end all and be all. So feel free to design with your body and your mind's eye, kind of walk through, nudge things, swap plants around. If you realize that you, if you realize that you bought too many plants, pulse them out. Maybe you can put them in your backyard. Maybe you'll have to give them to a friend, but don't just plant too many plants if that's what you realize. So, you, you know, you kind of go through. Here's it immediately after planting. This is when people, most people say, oh my gosh, everything's tiny. It's never going to grow in. I always plant small, even our trees, if they're available in one gallon plants, uh, plant them very small. If you did your research, right plant, right place, and all of that, they're going to grow. Don't worry about it. Don't go and buy a bunch of extra plants at this point in time. You'll regret it. Then get mulch, and we use the process called sheet mulching to make a temporary biodegradable after about a year or so weed barrier, which will prevent most of the grass from coming back up because 
we didn't do this way ahead of time, which would be the best practice and, and leave it down for at least a couple of months. We had more growing back than we would have otherwise, but we stayed on top of it enough. Here's about two months. You know, this is this is our Western red bud tree, but it's gonna grow. It's starting to get a little color. Here's working in, starting to build in the, the rainwater harvesting part of it, two and a half months. So you still don't see the design yet. Things are starting to grow. And then at about five months, one day in August, just had the screen open and realized, I don't really see that much of that wood chip mulch anymore. It's actually a garden. You can't see the design yet necessarily because things are still, still small, but here's that red bud that was really tiny, starting to grow, get lots of color, even about six months in. Habitat in action. This is evidence that native leaf cutter bees are using Western red bud, which they love to build their nests. Little moments of the around a kind of informal dry stream bed starting to grow in. Hummingbirds moving in, taking up full time residence in the yard. If you build it, they will come. And still, you know, even though things are growing in, starting to get these nice moments. So, uh, this is trash day in my neighborhood in the morning on my way to work. You know, always you'll, you'll lose some plants. So, this is a good, it's a red buckwheat that didn't make it. Good way to question, you know, was this the right plant for the right place? Uh, this actually ended up being maybe a little bit warm of a microclimate. We planted three buckwheats. We lost two of them. It was just a little too hot for the afternoon heat. One of the third one, you know, four years later, still going strong, loving life there. So, you know, who knows? But we eventually uh, planted something else. So, but here it is at six months. This is a landscape growing in. Like I mentioned, things go at different rates. So this, the sage, the deer grass goes quickly. This is a manzanita, a little bit slower, but we gave it more space to make sure it didn't get overwhelmed. And starting to get nice, you know, that color contrast, the texture contrast is coming in. Here it is at about 13 months. I had another pile of mulch delivered for the backyard. So I'm standing on top of it down to the garden. So we do have a lot of color going in the the backdrop hedge the trees are still going to take longer to grow in but a lot of the lower faster growing stuff has grown in and do start to have these lovely lovely moments here's the back side with the hedge still growing in here is the room that my cat spend most of their time looking out into and again, so I mentioned that what we actually put in is a little bit more of a wilder denser design than I would design for most average uh, homeowners, but but we really love that kind of naturalistic appeal that still you know has some conventional beauty to it. It's all pictures from the front yard. And then by working with that research, we also kind of plan to have flowers throughout much of the year. So here is April, where a lot of stuff is coming into bloom. And then here's June of that same year when a whole host of other things in that same area are also in bloom. But then also I talked about, you know, tapping into the seasons. So here's September record heat wave. This was, you know, after that 113 degree spell of weather that we had in 2020. Uh, and so here are more of those golds and browns. No garden looks the same year round. And so if you want to, you know, not have as much up and down, you can rely on a more evergreen sort of background. And in fact, as this hedge grows in, the native cherries and coffee berries are going to provide that, uh, but the, a lot of the faster growing plants are ones that go a little bit more dormant. Uh, but this still is a garden that, especially when you're actually in it, smells great. There's still birds and pollinators, and even on kind of some of the dried out uh, sages and stuff, we have all sorts of songbirds kind of pecking at them. And you can see by providing a balance here, we have... Uh, creeping Oregon grape. We have Canyon Prince wild rye. We have the yarrow in a spot where it's a little bit more sheltered that provide that sense of, uh, even though it's dry, kind of green backbone. And so here are some of those, you know, provide those structural, that structural backbone plants that as other plants might go into kind of their summer dormancy. When you have things like California coffee berry, I took these, not only was it really hot, there was wildflower, wildfires going on. And so you can see all the ash too. Uh, but even then, coffee berry, we had Baja pitcher sage, holly leaf cherry, sunset manzanita. These are the, some of those evergreen backbone that you couldn't quite see from that picture yet because some of those are more slow but steady as they grow in. 
but as they mature are going to be more present in the landscape. Toy on as well. And then in my backyard, I also do have some of those really in the heat of summer and into the fall really come into their own and perform well. So this is also during that same time period of, of kind of heat wave and wildfire, the buckwheats, another buckwheat, woolly blue curls, and the desert plant. So this is palmers or Indian mallow. It's very well. Desert willows, one of my favorite small trees, they just turn extra heat into more flowers. And so with that, we are just about at noon. Uh, there's always more than I want to cover, but what I do want to show you is there are some other notes, but all of the other stuff I was hoping to cover is actually covered much more extensively in our other workshops. And so for example, if you download the slides, it's a little bit of talk about mulches, but we have a whole online workshop about mulch and compost for water-wise gardens, where we go extensively into choosing mulch, your different mulch options, rocks, wood chips, decomposed granite, where to buy all of those recommended sizes, all of that. So you can check out that online workshop. I was hoping to do a few notes about design for habitat, but again, we have that whole workshop that I'm going to be teaching coming up online on the YouTube page about gardening for birds, butterflies, pollinators, and more, all through the lens of working with native plants. So that's a whole other workshop just about that. And then finally, we never have time to cover it. We do cover this really in the uh, the favorite plants for inland, or sorry, favorite plants for Southern California uh, gardens class. But here is for native plants, for the average person just getting started. If you download the slides, like I mentioned at the beginning of the chat, it's typed in there, cbwcd.org slash presentations. These are my kind of suggested basic plant palette. And a lot of these are gonna be great for much further out than these inland valley areas, but that's specifically what this was created for. So small trees, large trees, large shrubs, small shrubs, every category, just kind of a basic top plant palette. And so with that, I'm going to leave this at a page that lists in a lot of those links and resources. So there's a lot to know. And one of the cool things is that this is just an intro, but nobody has it all figured out. And you can talk to a hundred different people who have been doing planting design for a long time, and they're all going to have a different take. So this has really just been kind of my take uh, as to what I think are the top things to be thinking about and some kind of techniques to, to set the average person who's starting to think about this stuff up for success. Hopefully you've taken away at least a few things wherever uh, you are, whether you have been uh, gardening with native plants for a long time or are just getting started. Hopefully you've learned something. I am going to turn my attention now for those of you who have more time to answering uh, questions for quite a while. But what I want to do as I'm doing that is to launch just one last poll, which is a closing poll. I always want to know how I'm doing. Uh, so please let me know. And uh, in addition to this, any feedback that you have for the chat, I would really appreciate it. If there's something that you, obviously I'm always trying to fit way too much into these three hours because there's so much I want to share with people. Uh, so if there are any particular aspects that you found, found particularly valuable, or if you've been looking into this and there's something that you, know, you feel has been cleared up or that you now understand or you know you're going to use, uh, specifically letting me know in the chat would be super helpful to me because then I'll know as I try to weed things out and kind of make room for other stuff uh, to leave those in. If there's something that you didn't learn today that you're hoping for, or you have something more critical nature, please let me know as well, because I'm always trying to improve how I'm able to uh, synthesize all of this information down in an accessible way. And if there's something I can do better, I want to hear that as well. I always read through all the chat at the end and try to learn from it uh, so I can keep improving how I teach this area. Uh, so let's go to the questions. From Amy, is there a workshop for planting slash maintenance in fire areas? Great question. So my organization does not currently offer one. That is not something uh, that is specifically within 
my realm of where I'm most experienced, but there are other great resources out there. Uh, the number one that I'm going to recommend is checking out the Theodore Payne Foundation's website. They have a whole section on their website about uh, planting and gardening in fire areas. Uh, they are very close to where a few years ago there was the Latuna Canyon fire that actually got right to the edge of their property. And so they are embedded in a community that, that had gone through fire recovery. And they, after that, developed some amazing resources, working with the real experts, researchers on best practices. And that includes also uh, information about the home, immediately outside of the home, and in the garden. So check out Theodore Payne Foundation's resources for that. There's a whole section of their website that you'll be able to find about wildfire. I think they have workshop recordings as well. And then also check with your local fire district as well. Sometimes they have more local specific information. Something that I've known just doing my uh, own research on that is that sometimes what one area recommends is going to be a little bit different than another. So uh, yeah, I would say the local resources and Theodore Payne Foundation's resources would be the best place to start for fire. Uh, from Marcella, can putting mulch too close to roots of our native plants kill them? Should we plant for some space in between mulch and the roots? Absolutely. Great, great question. Uh, and you're on the right track. So we didn't really get into that because this is more about design, but we do talk about that in our installation and establishment for native and, and water wise gardens class. You never want the mulch to go right up to like the, the main stem or the trunk of the plants. Always give it at least three inches off of it. And for native plants, you know, whatever your, your mulch cover is, don't go too overboard. Like a couple of it inches is enough. Uh, you don't want to go with like underneath my fruit trees. If I have you know, four inches of wood chip mulch that I could put down there, I'm going to do that. That's too much for native plants because that where they are most sensitive to things related to too much moisture is right at what's called the root crown. That's right where the main stem or stems or trunk uh, goes into the soil and goes into the roots. That needs to be able to dry out. And in fact, the canopies of most native plants naturally as, as water, like when it rains, goes down through the leaves, uh, kind of shunts water a little bit away from that often, uh, depends on the plant, but that's often the case. And so you don't want that to yeah, accumulate too much moisture right there. It's also a good idea after you know a year or so to go back in and check and every once in a while, even for mature uh, native plants to, you don't need to do it obsessively all the time, but if there's a lot of leaf litter or mulch that's accumulated at the base, pull it away again. And, and once the plant has its kind of own canopy, I'd pull it away even a little bit further. Uh, okay. Let's see, I think that person has left. See, I'm kind of checking to make sure that these people are still here. Well, I think we're getting back to earlier questions. Okay, from Megan, what are good landscapes to have with dogs? I currently have mostly grass. A uh, great question. So there's a few ways you can go. And it depends on also the nature of your dog. What kind of dog you have? Little dog, big dogs, uh, dogs that don't particularly care about crashing through plants and digging big holes in the yard or dogs that do. Uh, knowing how your dog exists in the space or lives in a space is, uh, is really important. Because a lot of times if you have a small dog, then you know just plant whatever you would plant and then maybe have like one little space with a, with a native kind of meadow grass. So, uh, so there's a couple of different native kind of meadow. They're actually sedges, grass-like plants uh, that make really nice like little meadowy areas that don't take a ton of water, way less than a lawn. And you can have a limited amount of it for a dog. And you know the grass blades are longer, but dogs love to hang out in them. So one of them is called uh, dune sedge or meadow sedge, California meadow sedge, goes by a different couple of different names. One of them is called clustered field sedge or Western meadow sedge. Uh, they're they're pretty similar to each other. One gets a little bit taller. Uh, 
I have a small meadow of that. That's actually, those can take flooding. So that's my sunken area that I showed. And now that some shade has grown in, I give that a, a deep soak, like every two or three weeks. I, I let it go a little golden in the summer, but still like that's kind of enough. In full sun, it's probably going to be weekly. Uh, but yeah, that's great for a little spot for the dog. And then, and then you can have uh, you know, plenty of native plants and especially, you know, dogs really like these landscapes. Uh, there's lots of different smells and birds come around and older dogs will kind of find a nice spot to sit in the sun and enjoy it. Uh, if you have dogs that like to patrol, it's a good idea to leave some spots uh, away from the fence. So often for a design, I'll put a lot of plants right up against fences or property edges. But for dogs who kind of like to do their patrolling, they really like to patrol that. So sometimes young plants could get trampled. So that's an idea. Know your dogs. If there's certain ways they like to walk through the property, uh, maybe thinking about letting some of those be pathways. And then if you have dogs that are of the rambunctious sort, uh, if there's particular areas they're always running through, the grasses work really well because the bunch grasses, you know, there's not a bunch of little plant, uh, little stems to break. They can take some good amount of trampling. Uh, but things like sages are pretty brittle, especially when they're young. So you might need to protect them a little bit. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. Uh, also always a good idea. Most native plants are not toxic to dogs, but it's always a good idea if, if that's of concern to you, especially if you have one of those dogs that likes to just randomly eat things, uh, that there are lists online. ASPCA has one where double check your plants and make sure that they're not on any of those toxicity lists. Um, okay. Let's see what else we have. There. See if Marcella is still here. Marcella, have apple trees and orange trees. Can you incorporate these large trees into a native landscape? Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I have uh, the a big part of my backyard is ringed at the edge with fruit trees because that's also part of what I love growing. Uh, but those require more water. And so the easiest thing to do if you want to have native plants that are going to be in that wet zone is to plant plants that don't demand a lot of water, but that can tolerate water. Uh, check out the online recording of uh, our fruit trees. Was it fruit trees for Southern California gardens? I think it is. And I show some different slides, but one of the slides I show kind of towards the end where we talk about different approaches to growing fruit trees is what my partner and I do at home, which we call it our orchard meadow, where we have a whole bunch of native plants under and around those fruit trees that can tolerate a little bit more uh, water. And a lot of those are great for pollinator and butterfly habitat. So those are some of the native asters do really well. Yarrow does really well. It'll spread all over the place and kind of make a green ground cover with that much irrigation. And we just kind of cut that back with a string trimmer once a year. And that actually helps cycle nutrients and it creates its own mulch. Uh, and then some of our other uh, like red buckwheat, uh, penstemons, verbenas, this is a flower of the verbena here. Uh, you know, they're low water plants, but I've just from experience have kind of learned that they can tolerate uh, that higher amount of irrigation with your fruit trees. So good, good once a week kind of silk. Whereas a lot of the other ones, uh, you can have them farther away where it's drier. So immediately outside of the zone that the fruit, that the sprinklers that my fruit trees uh, get, you know, like immediately outside of the zone where uh, the water is applied to the fruit trees, you can tr transition to drier native plants pretty uh, pretty quickly. Uh, some of them will get a few roots into that irrigated zone and might grow very luxuriously, but as long as they're not being directly watered, kind of within the area of their foliage, normally they can kind of handle things. Uh, Amy, on talking about the sedges, do you know, are all sedges considered turf looking grasses by the MWD rebate? You should be good. I have uh, helped a number of people with uh, designs using the, those uh, sedges for their rebates and they have been fine. What I tell people to do is when they submit their landscape design, uh, one of the, the designations is that, and I don't know how 
specific they get into it. But when I was asking some questions with some of the people at MWD to make sure I was going to be good for recommending these at the beginning, uh, basically what they said is, you know, if if you're going to plan on mowing it, because those sedges you can mow, and then it'll look pretty similar to turf, uh, then that's not acceptable. But if it's going to be kind of a naturalistic meadow, then that's okay. So I specifically, when I'm submitting the design or when I'm telling someone who's submitting the design to MWD, you know, say like, don't call it a lawn, but you can say, you know, the sedge, sedge meadow, or even just sedge planting, you know, and then even make a note, you know, naturalistic or something like that, you know, not cut back or something, make it very obvious that, that you're not trying to make it look like a lawn. And then at least in terms of uh, my experience, you should be just fine. Okay, let's see if there's anything else. We might be getting to the end of it. From Pamela, are there any plants you might be aware of that gophers don't like? I am not aware of any native plants that are so detested by gophers that if you have a lot of gophers, they will leave them alone. Uh, if you have a lot of gophers, you have two options, really. Uh, you can plant, especially your shrubs, uh, it can cause problems with larger trees, but you can plant your shrubs and your perennial plants in uh, gopher baskets, which are basically like the wire mesh baskets to protect at least the main root system. And you need to make sure the top of it pokes above the ground some. Uh, sometimes, I mean, you can make them yourself out of chicken wire, but it takes a lot of work. But there are companies, I know one of them that I've used in the past is called Diggers, where you can basically order them, they ship flat and you pull them apart and fold the bottoms underneath. And uh, there you have your gopher basket, or they could be trapped. Uh, and normally that's a trap that kills them, which some people are going to be okay with, and some people will detest. That is up to you. But those are really your two options. Or you know, hope for the best and realize that you will probably lose a significant amount of plants if you have a lot of gophers. Uh, the one thing you should never, ever, ever, ever do is use poisons for gophers, even though that is, uh, to some people, it seems quicker and easier. Uh, what happens is that oftentimes those gophers won't necessarily stay uh, down in their burrows as they are dying, and that can uh, poison uh, hawks coyotes, whatever might be in your area. But even in an urban area, uh, sometimes a gopher that's not doing very well could get picked up by a hawk or a bird of prey, and you do not want to be responsible for that. Um, okay, let's see. I think... Okay. Last question, and then I will have to be heading out. Uh, what if what is an effective method to keep squirrels from eating all of your citrus fruit? That is a good one. Uh, and it really depends on your neighborhood. In some neighborhoods, the squirrels will you know get a few citrus, but not in all of them. Some they'll be very aggressive. Uh, if you have a small citrus tree, you can try using uh, bird netting and just make sure if you do use that netting, uh, which is kind of a pain to work with, make sure that you, you have to pull it all the way down to a single trunk at the base and tie it very securely. And then anytime you harvest fruit, you need to retie it. And you need to do it for two reasons. If it is not tied completely securely, the squirrels will just go up on the inside and they might get stuck in there. And also uh, birds might get stuck in there and you don't want that. So you have to tie it very securely and go from there. The, the other thing to do would would uh, would be sometimes you can make, uh, if they're crawling up from the base of the tree, uh, as long as you, you trim up any of the lower branches, if it's big enough, you can sometimes, and you can find, you know, online kind of, you, you make like a collar at the base of it that's of a shape uh, that the squirrels can't really climb up, but if there's a wall, other trees or anything nearby, they can just jump into it. So it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of difficult. There's not a perfect answer. Or if they really eat all of them and you have to give up, then you can maybe give up on the citrus and plant a beautiful native tree. Uh, 
But yeah, hopefully that'll help. And remember that you always have to pay your taxes. And so what I tell people if they're growing fruit trees is aim at getting 50% of the harvest and the rest of it going to wildlife, just accept it. And that just might be realistic. And then oftentimes, if you get more than 50%, feel really good about it. But sometimes they do eat them all. And in that case, uh, you need to choose your battles and, and maybe uh, just have to accept the fact that the squirrels have more time than, than you do. And that's just them making a living. Uh, so hopefully that's helpful. Uh, I think with that, we'll wrap it up. So remember, uh, check out our upcoming workshops, the website, and please, please sign up for the newsletter. If you don't get it already, that's the best way to hear about everything else coming up from the WaterWise Community Center. Thank you for spending a good chunk of your Saturday morning with me and have a good rest of your weekend.